Okay, we are live, Bob. Thank you very much for joining me here today on Hard Truths number two. So this is Hard Truths number two here with Bob Greenier. He is one of the uh, engineers and scientists who has looked at our MH370 videos, and I wanted to give him a platform to talk about his research, his science. And so without further ado, Bob, I want to let you go ahead and introduce yourself, your background, you know, tell us why you've gotten interested in your research. Well, thank you very much, Aston, for your work and for inviting me to your podcast. I feel very honored to uh, follow Salvatore Pai uh, and being the second person on your podcast. Uh, for those that are listening on the MFMP YouTube stream, uh, it's going to be a bit broken, but I will upload the full stream uh, that Ashton is recording. Uh, so uh, full credit for the work that you've done in this uh trying to nail down what happened in the uh, MH370. It was a bit of a mystery to me when I when I first saw it. And uh, full credit with bringing together an open research, research uh, project as such that you've done. Um, it's something that I've been familiar with and been working uh, on in the last 11 years. And so uh, it's it's great to see this kind of thing emerging in different areas to solve intractable problems and i think uh, one of the most intractable mysteries of the last i i would say 100 years is where did mh370 go <laughs> so uh yeah so uh how, how did i where did i start um well essentially um i've always been interested in energy uh, i bought into the global warming uh, narrative uh, from a very early age. I only used recycled furniture in my bedroom. I built a uh, a mirror tile solar concentrator onto the single 12 by 12 inch uh, uh, solar collector that I could afford at the time uh, way back when I was young and I charged a lead acid battery up and ran a fan and a light in my room off it. I built uh, my parents had a a motel and I built a solar heating system for the swimming pool there um, so it wasn't all doom and gloom in my early <laughs> early years but I was doing what I could yeah. and I've always been fascinated in science um, go on I was just gonna have you been an engineer whole life then which is that what you came back Yes, in, in a way, yes. I, I was very lucky that I grew up with a father whose um, bloodline had a history of metalworking, being blacksmiths. And we had a farm, actually, um, which was also my grandfather's farm. And so I work, grew up with machines. And uh, also we had family anvils and we had a welding plant and we had angle grinders and all kinds of tools around the place and uh, were given a fairly free reign to do all, all kinds of uh ridiculous things with metals and 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 explosives and things like that so i had a let's put it there this way with the three brothers i had a rich childhood and and experienced things that uh, not everyone has the fortune uh, to experience and so uh w when it came to 1989 i was uh, born in 1972 so uh, and right, right in 1989, I was very, very passionate about science. And um, I was reading uh, New Scientist journals back to back, even the job adverts, which was a bit weird, I know. But anyway, um, <laughs> and so I had like um, uh, a great interest when I saw this uh, Czech born uh, uh, scientist who actually came to live in my hometown and went to a school uh, just 15 minutes walk from where I, the house that I was born into um, and went to my father's school um called martin fleischman and he worked at southampton university and he went off and worked with this guy called uh, stanley pons in in the us and they wanted to look at sort of these um uh, deuterium palladium um sort of uh, experiments and look to see if in a metal lattice uh, deuterium could be put into a position where it would actually cause some kind of nuclear reaction. And so there was this uh, work by Panath and Peters and, and Wendt and, and, and different people that had explored these things. And in fact, the, the, um, the palladium was actually determined before the electron and even the uh, uh, deuteron was determined to be the material that actually absorbed the most um, uh, hydrogen isotope 
uh, in, uh, in, I think, 1876 by Thomas Graham, FRS. I might have got the, the date wrong, but that's the guy. So it'd been known for uh, m more than 100 years that palladium was the metal that could absorb the most hydrogen isotope and that, um, you know, there had been some claims in the 20s and 30s and stuff of some kind of transmutation occurring. So they, they explored this and they put their own money in for a number of years and I think it was around about five years and they were kind of forced into this position by uh, a guy called Stephen E. Jones who was brought in uh, to kind of verify what they were seeming to find uh, by the Department of Energy, um, whether they were actually seeing what they were claiming, which was uh, he kind of gave the name to it called Cold Fusion, although Martin Fleischmann and Stanley Pons really didn't like the idea of that, that phrase being used. They were very uncomfortable with it because they didn't really know what it was at the time. Um, but anyway, they... they um, were forced into a situation where they kind of did an early press release and then they were kind of writing the paper on the back end uh, and then various people were brought in by uh, George Bush Sr. to kind of give a six-month crash, can we replicate this? And this very famous story um, at MIT, they, they, they doctored their data to remove their own findings um, uh, to try and uh, paint the fact that cold fusion is dead. And in fact, there's a, a person in the community called Ruby Carrot, and uh, she worked with this guy called Matt Howarth. And uh, they produced this book called Discover Cold Fusion. It's a little comic book, actually. So this is something uh, which you can get to understand the little story in here. It's got all the main characters in there. It's being curated by the, um, the kind of community around this. But there's one thing which I think people may not be aware about this story. They might have been aware of the people that called it the scientific fiasco of the century. However, they might not be aware about what happened in 1985. And this is called the Pons and Fleischmann Singularity, according to me. And in the book, it's uh, got a little diagram here, this little comic here. And what this was, they had a 1cc chunk of palladium. And they'd been loading it, as I understand it, for a couple of weeks. And they had found that it wasn't doing much so they dialed down the voltage on there which in my view changes the electrostatic pressure and they kind of walked away from it and anyway they came in after the weekend to find the water tank had uh, all the water had disappeared the water tank had blown up it had gone through the glass through the the formica in the wet fume hood cupboard or whatever it'd gone down into the concrete removed a large chunk of crong concrete and in the air there was this five sus fine suspension of particulates and they realized that this was far beyond nuclear um and this is a story that most people know about whether they have an opinion about cold fusion as it was called um uh, i call it coherent matter nuclear reactions and there's a mechanism that drives it but they're not aware of this event. And I've had it the whole variously described as, you know, fairly large to if you take your fist and you put it in. Now, you imagine concrete. It's got maybe some aggregate in there. It's got some uh, cement in there. What can boil all that water off, damage all that equipment, and then turn a large lump of concrete, having gone through the table, into a very large... There's a very fine suspension of particles that didn't like settle over a long period of time. What is going on with that? And so this actually, frankly, scared them. And they decided that they were going to use much smaller samples uh, from that point onwards. But that was never really discussed in the public domain. And it took a few years before I, I learned of this story, even when I was working within the community. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, uh, and a recap, because I, I think I forgot to press the live stream there. So for the people who are watching, uh, Bob was just going over some of his tea and the reason why he got involved in science and engineering, going through his background as he grew up. Uh, I was being interested in engineering, uh, helping out his farm, Emily, et cetera, and talking about cold fusion, which, um, you know, I thought it was very, I mean, you were just describing there, what I'd really like to explain for our audience, you know, for the layman in terms of 
what is cold fusion and why is it important for us to understand that? Right? Uh, well, uh, you know, my audience is people who are, they were really walking in simple purposes. So I, if you really were to dumb it down for us, so I'll, 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 I'll dumb it, I'll dumb it. In, I'll dumb it down to the simplest experiment that has cold and what appears to be fusion going on. The second person to come out with anything along the lines of cold fusion was a guy called Francesco Piantelli. And I had the pleasure of visiting him in January 2015 in his lab in Siena. And he was in 1989... Uh, in August of 1989, conducting a biology experiment. And in that experiment, uh, he had a nickel rod on which he had a mouse brain cell that was alive and it was being kept alive by being in an oxygen-rich environment and having a stimulation from an electric probe above. Okay. Now, the idea of this was to flush that chamber with hydrogen, start the death of the cell, and then freeze the chemistry a certain amount of time after the uh, cell had started to die and then analyze the chemistry of the cell. And the idea was to try and find chemicals that would allow you in cases of strokes or when you're going up the top of a mountain and you've got low oxygen levels to prevent brain damage in these scenarios. So that was, he was a biologist, right? The Professor Francesco yeah. Piantelli. And what happened was uh, he'd been doing a several cycles of these experiments and this liquid helium now liquid helium is four kelvin it's like pretty much the coldest stuff you can get without start doing laser cooling and and the sort of stuff that's used and, and has been used to create the first coherent condensates of say sodium 23 atoms or cesium 133 atoms and what he did was uh this particular time after a number of cycles he put in a uh, uh, the cooling and what happened was it started to boil it was boiling this 250 watts of cryogenic cooling continuously. Mm. There's no power being provided. What is going on? Okay, so he knew he had nickel and he knew he had hydrogen before and, and electri electricity going on before this occurred. And he ended up by um, effectively discovering in a biology experiment the nickel-hydrogen cold fusion system. And in this context... It, you can understand that it was cold and that someone something was creating heat that was boiling the very cold thing into a boiled state. So this is the best thing I can say to as an experiment actually did fusion, but in the cold state. It's obviously not at tens of millions of degrees in, in, a, in a hot plasma bashing particles together. This is something that is in the domain of producing coherent matter and it is in the domain of uh, having hydrogen isotope in there with a, uh, a catalytic metal known as nickel. Now, for most of my understanding of this science, until about 2019, 2000 and, yeah, 2000, 2020 actually, um, I believed, as probably most of your listeners will do, that coherent matter could only occur at near absolute zero. Now, why? Well, the thing is that, yeah, and so like basically it was predicted, but for instance, the Bose-Einstein condensate was predicted a very long time ago by these two characters, Bose and Einstein. And I think it was 1996 or 1997 um, that they actually first created one of, of this material in the West. Uh, and what they did is they cooled it down to near absolute zero. And at this temperature, let's say you're using, for instance, a sodium-23. It's a single isotope, which means if you describe the matter as a wave, you can describe it as a wave. It only has one type of wave, but the wave changes its frequency based on its thermal energy, its kin kinetic energy. Okay, and this is called the de Broglie wave, right? Okay, and so uh, what you want to do is by cooling it down to near absolute zero, you are getting the same wave and you are getting it into the same wavelength, but it's still out of phase. And that's where you have a substrate. And the substrate is like, if you have a load of metronomes on a table, after a while, they end up in sync, yes? Okay, and this is like, you have a substrate, and that's like your spring, and all your atoms are sitting on there. They're all at the same temperature. They're all got the same wavelength, but then they come into phase. And then you have the same wave, 
same wavelength and the same phase and they become coherent and they start losing their identity as individual atoms and they become a coherent matter wave. Now, what I didn't realize is that this can actually happen at any temperature. So there is a patent awarded to Lockheed Martin. You might know them. They are a major uh, um, man manufacturer of uh, peacekeeping equipment, one might say. Uh, and... <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Um, and so basically what they they did they had a patent i think it was 2013 i think it was published in 2017 and it is the first thing i discussed on my blog on which is at remoteview.icu and so what what this is is a um they are uh, producing uh coherent matter but they note that all you need is the same matter at the same temperature and in phase. Now, the same matter can even be an electron, except you have to create a Cooper pair first by having two electrons. Okay? Then you need the same energy and in phase. And to do that, they use something called the Aronhoff bomb effect. Okay? And then they use micro cavities. And the combination of these these aspects leads to the production of a coherent matter wave of any kind of matter at any temperature so really? yes so this dispels the myth that you need to be at absolute zero this means you can have fusion occurring at different temperatures you just need to have them the same matter in the same phase it able to form a condensate so if you are a fermion you need to get it into a bosonic state and in the case of an electron you need to get two electrons uh, uh, 180 degrees uh, basically they, they got up and down spin and, and you end up with them uh, forming a, 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 a boson and then the boson can occupy the same space time over and over and over again now the Aronhoff bomb effect is best explained um, by the Penrose staircase and so essentially when you are going this is kind of like that Escher staircase where you, if you go round and you look like you're going down you're actually not you're staying in the same point and if you're going up you're going round and you're staying in the same point and these are called a phase singularity and the phase singularity is able to get matter to uh, uh, and particularly if you've got electrons uh, to be in phase and so what do I mean by in phase well does anyone know what a laser is yeah what is a laser a laser is something like the same photon i.e the same photon energy so it has the same photon wavelength but then it's in phase and so it's the same thing you need you're thinking of it as the same thing and this comes down to what really is matter and so you know what yeah. is matter what would you say matter is ashton yeah it's energy but in different form or I mean, e equals mc squared oh that's what i would say is that matter is energy how close am i don't correct me if they're I'm pretty wrong. pretty close they are interchangeable and you can't get energy out of nothing it has to come from something so the the way i like to you know a lot of people say that um energy and light are in, uh, energy and matter are kind of interchangeable um but it's not so easy to get from one to the other so often people will say that um, matter is just trapped light. Well, I'm going to give you an example of what matter is and that is trapped light. If you take an electron and you take a positron, which is the antimatter of the electron, okay, and you fire them at each other, they will annihilate. And what you get produced is two photons at 511 keV going at 180 degrees from each other. Now, what is significant about two 511 keV photons? I'll tell you. That is the mass of an electron and a positron. So there's a conversion 
of the matter, the electron, into a electromagnetic wave. And so you can actually do matter synthesis by taking a gamma wave, firing it into ordinary matter, and it can produce an electron and positron pair. So you can do matter synthesis and you can do matter uh, uh, desynthesis. Okay, the electron is probably the easiest example, um, and this is you know it's actually used in practical technology like positron emission tom tomography. Well, actually, it's because of the the decay. Uh, you get positron coming out that produces a, 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 an annihilation event and you can see these photons coming out okay so um so there's real technology so essentially cold, cold fusion is coherent matter nuclear reactions you're getting matter into a state where they can occupy the same space time and uh the, the structure that does that, in my view, I will talk about as, 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 as we move through. But this is the thing that effect effectively was created by Pons and Fleischmann when they had that singularity. And what they created, in my view, was ball lightning. Ball lightning and micro ball lightning and itty bitty bitty micro ball lightning and extremely small ball lightning and very big ball lightning... They're all quantizations of a sta stable plasma structure, which has at its core a toroidal vortex structure. So let me just ask you, I'm going to recap real quick, because uh, someone was breaking up. I just want to make sure my audience can hear what we were discussing, because after that was pretty amazing. Um, pretty much describe what cold fusion is, how it comes about. I think some of the points that I heard there, and you, I wonder anything that I might have missed is you no know, matter is essentially trapped a lot. Cold fusion can ha happen at temperature, which might was Einstein condensate. Say it can be different temperatures as well. I'm not sure if that's it, but that, that matter can revert to an electromagnetic. And the idea behind going from fermion to a boson, which is it has different points in space time compared to boson, which is like a laser beam, where we can flip that as a matter of aligning the wave so that the waves cohere one another. Um, that can cause coherent matter reaction. Is that uh, uh, pretty accurate? Did I miss anything important in there? Yeah, I mean, essentially, the, that's you, pretty awesome. For, 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 you can actually create coherent energy from all kinds of things. So there are these active denial systems that use what's called SASER, which is effectively the equivalent of a laser, but using sound. And they they are terrible. They are disgusting weapons, actually. They're not just active denial, because when the, uh, the coherent sound comes into your skin, it goes into your piezoelectric bone or your piezoelectric tendons or your piezoelectric teeth, and you get what's called phase conjugation. The sound comes back, and you get the, the same stuff we produce in ultrasonic experiments that does cold fusion in your body. So it actually mashes up your body. It's disgusting that is even allowed to be permitted. It should be banned. In the case of laser, laser people understand laser, but there's a thing called maser. And a maser is, is a microwave laser. And there's also called baser, which is essentially a coherent matter wave, right, beam. So a, a baser is, is a bosine, a, a, a Bose condensate laser, okay? Um, so there's these different yeah. things about dealing with uh, coherent matter and the um if you look at what is in the lockheed martin patent um and i will i will pull it up here probably that's probably a good thing to 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 pull up so people can understand that this is a real thing and um uh, it, 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 it's 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 sadly it, i i mean uh, well I'll, I'll come to that in a minute so essentially we launched this yeah we, we launched this project uh what it was was it all went quiet there was a, an, an effective disinformation campaign uh, around this technology i don't know the truth in this but but there is a story out there that stanley pons had a gun put to his head when he opened the door and it it, it sh you know scared him so much that he literally fled the u.s i think he relinquished he was half french half half um uh, American. He gave up his um, American passport um, and he went to France and he was funded by Toyota and they worked together for about five years f funded by Toyota down in, in France. And essentially no one has seen uh, 
<laughs> Stanley Pons. He's still alive. Unfortunately, Martin Fleischmann died in the year that I tried to go to the first conference in this field uh, in 2012. Um, but he did write the foreword to a book uh, called Fusion in All Its Forms um, by uh, um, Jean-Paul Barbarian, who's a, a leader in the uh, uh, condensed matter nuclear science field. So, and I understand at the time that, that they, they both fled and they, they dumped their equipment with whoever they could to get out the country. I mean, it was a really frightening scenario for them. And I don't know how many people knew about the event that I talked about, this singularity, where they saw something well, in their opinion, beyond nuclear, a coherent matter, ball lightning-like effect, in my view. Um, and so there was, a, there was a campaign to shut them down and... I didn't get interested in this until there was a very flamboyant um, guy called Andrea Rossi who uh, went public claiming all kinds of things and he tried to actually reach out to Piantelli originally to get his engagement and Piantelli refused and then he went to a guy, a nuclear scientist at Bologna University called Sergio Ficardi and he stepped in and kind of gave credibility to what Rossi was doing. Whatever, whether Rossi had something, has something, or never had anything, it's completely irrelevant. What he did was he did showmanship. And the showmanship got me and at least four other people to go to the conference in South Korea at the Keist Material Institute of, uh, of South Korea. And when we were there, um, we were looking at all of these scientists who were seeing the same kind of products being synthesized in solid phase fusion systems, in liquid phase, and in plasma phase, gas phase, whatever. They were seeing it across all these different systems, but they had at least 70 theories. And so, and they were all trying to win the new Nobel Prize. And like, if you've got 70 theories, well, at least 69 of them are wrong, right? <laughs> so, so when you ask what is cold fusion, it's not quite so trivial. And so, um, but what was interesting is that if anyone was having a reasonable amount of success, either a pseudo private entity or a private entity maybe, or a government body would swoop in, they would invest and they'd get them spinning plates until they died and dying they were. And we realized as a collective, the, the so-called young people, we weren't that young, but <laughs> younger than a lot of them um, in the room, we realized that if, if someone doesn't do something radically different, then these people are going to die with all of this incredible wealth of knowledge. So we came together, it was four of us, uh, and formed the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project, which you can see at quantumheat.org. This was the original website. It's mostly an archive site, although there is a current project up on there right now uh, called Thor. And essentially, uh, the idea was, is um, I wanted to create a system where we could publish experiments live on the internet, unredacted data, and that people could guide and inform on the design of the experiment, uh, you know, the, the, the protocol, what equipment was being used, how the analysis should be conducted, and so on. And then they would have the live data actually published as the experiment's being conducted. And they could actually comment and suggest how the experiment should change. And we were doing this with equipment that a guy called Ryan Hunt, one of the founders, uh, actually made him, his father made it, and it was like for monitoring home energy systems, and they repurposed it so we can actually show these live datas. And this was before any of the major uh, digital acquisition uh, uh, companies could actually um, do this kind of thing. And we needed then one person, at least, to provide us with an experiment. Okay. And one person did come forward. And that person was a guy called uh, Francesco Cellani, and he worked for the Italian Nuclear Frascati Institute. And he had a piece of constantin wire that's nickel and copper, and it was loaded with hydrogen, and he would heat it up, and he would see excess heat. And he had shown an amount of excess heat to the tune of in excess of 20% at National Instruments Week in Texas and in the conference. And it was a live demonstration. So we set about raising some money, uh, and it was all funded by small donations uh, from the uh, public and from our own personal resources as people setting up this open project. 
and a lot uh, that early work was largely funded uh, by Ryan Hunt's father, Paul Hunt. So thank you to him, um, and so and thank you to all of the people that helped this work. Um, and essentially, the claimant they next wanted to do uh, fusion by the, increase their excess heat by raising the temperature, and they had a thing called borosilicate glass. And they next wanted to use fused quartz. Now, the borosilicate glass softens about 300 degrees C. Borosil uh, uh, fused quartz can go up to like 1,700 degrees C. So we thought, well, they want he wants to do that next, so let's do that now. And so we did it, and we didn't see any excess heat. So we thought, we've done the first thing wrong. The first thing is, don't try and change the experiment. We, we changed the experiment. I know the experimentalist was going to do it, but we changed the experiment. So we went to borosilicate glass. And we attempted a second time, this was with Mathieu Vellat, another director of the project, in, and we started the experiment on 12 seconds past 12 minutes past 12 on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th California time. Of course, it was started in France, but anyway, <laughs> we thought that's not going to happen again. And two days later, I was in a military base in Rome, publicly giving the data. We had achieved 12.5%. It would have been better if it was 12%, but it was 12.5%. <laughs> and so, and then um, I gave my presentation. The experiment was still running. They could analyze the data live at the back of this uh, military base presentation room. And after I gave my presentation, I walked out of the room and I was probably about eight meters from the room. And I heard this uh, fairly sturdy, brisk, footsteps running up behind me and on my left shoulder this Italian general tapped me and he said to me and he, he kind of whispered in my ear he says you need to use an alkaline metal and I said well wh what do you mean like lithium and he said and he just smiled and walked off and it was much later that we found out that they did use deuterium, but when you take pure water like you get from a scientific grade from a supplier, chemical supplier, and you take the, 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 the heavy water, so that is not H2O, it's D2O, okay? You need to make an electrolyte so you can do the electrolysis. And it turns out, and we were actually through um, uh, Jean-Paul Barbarian, um, Pons showed and handed over some of their stock of their electrolyte, which was lithium aluminium deuteride. So they had lithium in their experiments. Okay. So lithium in the secret then? Is that the secret sauce? So that well, the secret I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I'll tell you I'll one of these things we can turn into a boson and Go ahead. So have you heard of Castle Bravo? Uh, I have not. I'm, I'm pretty new to all this. I'm my best to catch up on the science. So, so Castle Bravo, I think it was the largest atmospheric test or the largest nuclear test in, I think, the Polynesian Islands. I don't know, like out, out in uh, an atoll out in the Pacific. OK. Um, and it was it yielded two and a half times their expected yield. Now. What what normally happens is you get neutrons, they go into lithium-6, and that forms two tritons, two, two heavy hydrogens, and they go and do more fusion, okay? Um, because the one of the easiest reactions is a deuterium and a tritium in, in a thermonuclear bomb, okay? So, and, and in fact, if you look at fusion reactors, they will have a lithium jacket, and the lithium jacket is where the neutrons are caught, caught by the... And what it has is the, the lithium itself has a high cross-section. What that means is it's good at stopping neutrons. So one, you stop the neutrons. And two, you convert that into more tritium, right? <laughs> and so um, what they didn't expect is the lithium-7 actually playing a role. Okay, and now lithium-7 is most of lithium. So if you don't purify your lithium, I think it's like, it's only like... A, 
ten percent or at most, I think it's something like that. Is is uh, lithium six off the top of my head? You can go and look it up. All these things. I'll say some slightly vague things, and and they're all things you can look up in Wikipedia. And it's like go and do your homework. So <laughs> it's like I could do yeah. it now, but it's it will stop my flow. So the the basic thing is. Um, yeah. The, the basic thing is that, that, that it was lithium-7 that's responsible. Now, I have given in presentations that, uh, in recent years, that the nuclear research uh, um, groups in, in Russia have found that... Um, <laughs> okay, th this is a bit of a jump in the logic here, but um, you, these clusters are made from... A weird stuff it, it's complicated to go into it but um essentially it's tesla's etheric matter streams and there's a guy called kurolz and and shushkin and another one shishkin and another one called dubovic uh, vladimirovich dubovic and he is a total savant uh, he there's an electric field and there's a magnetic field, an electric dipole, and a magnetic dipole. And these are all things that are well understood in the West. He discovered, as part of his thesis, working at Dubna, the nuclear research center north of Moscow, in 1965 and published in 1967, something called the toroidal moment. And this, yeah. this uh, thing, which I will show some imagery in a little while, um, this allows you to um, uh, create structures that have what's called a non-radiating boundary, and ultimately, I believe that they are the thing that causes a ball lightning. Anyway, what they found is that there is a structure. Yes, you could that. Go on. Yeah, well, you mentioned ball, ball lightning. Um, first question I have on the quick is. Is ball something that can naturally occur and then that we have to produce? Then with the non-radiating degree, is that the shell, the ball lightning? How would you define that? So I can show you papers from 1992 from Edwards Air Force Base, which are declassified. I can show you them on this stream where they show this non-radiating boundary and that they have quantized their levels, which means... When you know this science, you know that there will be scales at which this can operate. Okay? And you will know which subfractal scale you will need to generate the fractal scale above. And the skin is, it would appear, superconducting and superfluid. And we can show in our experiments where we've had exactly that kind of interaction with other material and when when it gets into this state it can cut through anything the actual it's like a literally like a star trek shield like totally like a star trek shield if you built this and someone was firing something from the outside it would it would eat the thing whatever speed it's traveling at one atom at a time <laughs> it would just become part of the borg on the outside <laughs> but we we've done it the other way around where a guy called hank urin has created these things in his experiment and it only cuts on this boundary layer when it gets up to this threshold and it like will cut tungsten like that <laughs> immediately but it does nothing until it gets to a particular point and then there is another one where uh, we've got this copper tube here and I've got it right here in front of me this one here which you can see and yeah, yeah. and this was a copper tube sat on, with a piece of iron above like this one and another one below. So thank you, Henk Uren. He he's operates out of Holland. And a ball lightning formed, uh, and hem it produces a hemisphere in this case, and it cut instantaneously a hemispherical section out of this copper pipe. Um, and it's like a flash. You see it on the camera, and you see the, the, the little flash. Now, there's several things I can offer alternative hypothesis for, for which you've tried to explain in in some of your discussions okay um uh but i, I need to just round out um the, the 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 angle i was on previously um which yeah. is sure. Go ahead. if you are able to get a copy of this out of print book the secrets of cold war technology project harp and beyond by jerry vasilatos he talks about how nikola tesla when he was doing his unidirectional uh, disruptive discharges, he would 
at a distance create feel these pinpricks in his body and these are similar to those observed by people who have been close to natural ball lightning he would go back 15 feet from his uh, device and he would get, still get these pinpricks he would then erect a glass sheet he would still get the pinpricks he would then erect a copper sheet and still get the pinpricks he only found that he didn't get the pinpricks if he, if he was using magnesium beryllium or aluminium anything heavier and he would start to get these pinpricks and he called these pinpricks the result of uh, dirty etheric matter streams okay these are toroidal clusters of something that's inside matter. Okay, it, they, they call it the hidden energy within matter in, in Russia. And there was a declassified 1992 document on the CIA's website. It was declassified in 2017 uh, called um, something like, uh, oh God, I can't remember it offhand. Um, to, uh, journey to Alpha Centauri or something like that and it, it was about extracting enough energy from one kilo of iron with a technology that would also provide the propulsion technology to get to Alpha Centauri in six years from the energy that is extracted from one kilo of iron and the energy extraction technology is the propulsion and by the way in the same document the, bearing in mind this is 1992 they say that this is the same technology as cold fusion. They literally say it is the same technology, right? So, what 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 Karol's, uh, Dubovic and and um, Shishkin have established is that for hydrogen isotopes, it's two to four thousand times easier to create this etheric matter that Tesla observed than for any other element beyond lithium which implies you can create the etheric matter from lithium is a similar level of ease wow. so um this is far more interesting than just creating coherent matter from a uh, um an alkaline metal this is this is creating something that is subatomic um and they believe it's a cluster of what's called background neutrinos background neutrinos yeah. comprise of more than like two and a half times the mass of all of the visible plasma planets like if you take our solar system 99.8 percent of the mass of our solar system is the sun right the rest of it is just flecks of dust running around that yeah. <laughs> so and we're a small we're a small speck of dust right um we might think we're big and important but we're not right in 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 and you compare us to our sun to beetlejuice and it's like it's not even registering on the radar it's it's a speck of dust around beetlejuice so and yeah. you add up all of the suns in all of the galaxies in all of the universe and there's still two and a half times more of this stuff. And do you know what? It's all at 2.76 Kelvin. It's all the same stuff with the same wavelength at exactly the same temperature. It's a coherent matter condensate through the entire universe. It's one wave function everywhere, all at the same time. And this is what the toroidal moment can capture because it also has the ability. So it's a, it's a relic neutrinos. They are able to interact with two things, the weak force and gravity. The weak force and gravity. And these things can suck through. So I can go take you through a few slides. I can take you through a few presentations. But I believe that in a simple segment in this, using only the words of John Archibald Wheeler, the inventor often accredited to of the term black hole and of wormhole, I can use just a clip from him with what I've already told you to explain what you see in that video. Now the question is why did I get interested in that video? Well, in January 2021 yeah. I was asked to in be interviewed by Ross Coulthard as part of his work to <clears throat> Um, uh, try and work out what was going on between these various uh, so-called disclosures that were going on. And I yeah. described to him as probably the second or third person in my life that I've ever described to 
something that occurred to me and my siblings in 1979. I was standing, uh, I was just in the house, and my dad called us all down into our lounge, and this was at 32 Offington Gardens, Worthing, West Sussex, UK. You can go and look at it on Google Maps, right? 32 Offington Gardens, uh, Worthing, West Sussex, UK. And out of the back of our lounge, there's a glass, like, you know, big French doors, and he just told us to look up into the sky. It was a late summer evening in 19... I think it's 1979. I think I was about uh, seven years old. Uh, I might be wrong. You know, memory plays tricks with you sometimes. But anyway, that's that's where I think it is. And what happened was four lights went... And then he said, right, kids, you can go to bed. And I was like, what the... I don't even know what I'm seeing there. And I didn't think of anything other than like dad showing us something in the sky. That's nice. Dad, thanks. Goodbye. And I didn't think about it until one of the sponsors of our, of our project, a guy from Sweden, kept telling me to go and see the Serious Disclosure pro Project. And I thought, okay, all right, God, he, he's into UFOs. Like, that's fine. All right. All right. Finally, I relented after a couple of years of him trying to get, him, trying to get me to look at these things. And I, and I looked at it. I go, all right, that makes sense. All right. Well, maybe that's what my dad was showing me. And so I, I met him in Prague, um, and and I told that was the first person I told, like and I, I think it was maybe one other person, and then like the, then it was Ross Coulthard. Um and so when you started, it, what it was was Matthew Vallat who conducted that first successful experiment on the Francesco Cellani called Fusion, um, nickel copper system. He contacted me um, a number of weeks ago. And said, "Have you seen this?" And and I looked at it and I go, "Oh, I know what that is." <laughs> and and what you it, I've only recently, like in the cu last couple of months, realised that due east in the line that we were looking is Shoreham Airfield, which is the oldest custom-built airport in the world that's still running. Okay, there was a, there was an airstrip that was laid for the Wright brothers to land, but th this is the oldest one. And so my father had good contacts within the UK Navy. I know this for various reasons and because of what he did in the Navy. And he was also a very senior Mason and very well respected. And so is his father above him. And so I don't know whether it was put on because of his Navy contacts uh, because it, or was it because of his uh, association with the Masons. But this was 1979 right and they looked exactly like those spheres <laughs> that are running around that plane so i don't think this is a new technology and i can show you documents that will show or imply very strongly that this is not new technology and i can show you them in a minute <laughs> if you want to see them <laughs> so let's turn around for a quick question now before we dig into that mm -hmm. how did that you just told exciting that you had had, right? Did mm -hmm. that change you or did that, how did that do when you saw that? And did it change? Oh, you approach science. Did it make you interested in it? I'm just curious as your thoughts. I had literally no thoughts about it at all. You know what? I didn't think about it at all until after I saw the serious disclosure. Because I thought, well, yeah. hold on a minute. Like, because the point, the point was I looked at the Hestalen lights and the Hestalen lights were, um, there are phenomena in this valley in Hestalen in Norway, and there's you know there's a couple of metals. There's a lot of metals that are mined in that place, and it's got quartz, and it goes through these large temperature changes, and there is this um, sulfurous stream that runs through the centre. So you've got basically a big freaking battery there with a lot of piezoelectricity, and you know some people have claimed these things are uh, they're certainly unidentified aerial phenomenon or UFOs as we might have called them back in the day um, but they are free floating plasmoids uh, uh, of some type or uh, ball lightning they're essentially ball lightning and so I walk through how what we have observed and can repeat at will in experiments are the same things they're just bigger right they're, they're just a bigger quantization of this and there's a bigger one beyond that called earth lights and stuff and so there's a lot of the community so like I, I was already around the periphery of ball lightning and, and I literally had not thought about it. And then, then um, 
uh, I saw the serious disclosure and I thought, well, I better, I better start talking because I, I could realize that a lot of these things were natural phenomenon and you could man make them. And I'd already seen them. And I know my dad's not a freaking alien, right? <laughs> He's not an alien. So, so like, it, it, yeah. it can only be a thing that we're making. And since I've la deduced that it, it was from an air base, then um, maybe it was an early version of this as a defense system, you know? Or maybe it was just showing, oh, look, we can make these pretty plasma balls and we can control them. And the idea that you're moving around and you're changing direction very fast, that's because they're not a physical object and there's no one inside them. You're literally, if you, 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 you know how you can get a laser pointer and you can move it around really quickly in the sky. Well, imagine, imagine you've got some phase conjugation and, and you've got uh, some interferometry between electromagnetic waves and where they cross, you've got a cross point and the thing is stuck on that node. You could move that around as fast as you can move those beams around. These things would be relatively easy to control. It's like like chasing a you know a laser pointer with a cat <laughs> running around. So, so but, question on that on the, how they move it around. Um, so and this kind of digs into the videos a little while. But what I wanted to refer first thing is how do you think you would get control that uh, my approach would be that that would be a remote control function app that you would use. But based on that, so so firstly the movements that you see in that video. They are relatively trivial in mid to early 1990s animation software. I was the first trainer of new uh, official registered new tech lightwave trainer in the UK in the, in the 1990s, right? With, along with my business partner at the time. And with the software then, you can create those mo moments easily, right? The second thing is, yeah. why? Why three? Why three? Well, two... It's geometry. If you have two like this, you can't make a plane from two. I mean a plane not as in a plane flying, you know, get on it and go to another place. I mean a plane as in a, a piece of paper, <laughs> you know. You, can, you only define a line. If you have three like that, you can define a plane. And that means you know what the normal of the plane is, right? And you need this technology to have the central azimuth going through the central 90 degrees perpendicular to the plane. So it needs to come out there. The plane needs to be in the perpendicular to the plane that's created by the three points. And you'll see when it comes to its final position, before it pinches in and they rotate around to join their, their gravitational waves together, that, and I'll explain this with Wheeler's words, and it will be very simple, very simple, that um, for, you see them. Now, you, you show a picture of... Uh, a charged rod with water droplets moving around it in static with static electricity in in zero gravity i saw on your your thing okay so that's what happens right what whatever whether that's happening because it's happening it doesn't matter they need to get those things equidistant between each other and to a degree they will self-organize because they repel each other as well as attract each other okay then they need the then they need uh, to be aligned in the same azimuth. And then I will explain using Wheeler's work in a little while once we've gone over some uh, uh, principal context. Now, the moving them around, you, sy you synthesize them largely using the Lockheed Martin pattern. You need to create a lot of co coherent matter. And when you put it into a ball, in their pattern, and I think it's in drawing three, they show a buckyball-like structure of a coherent matter structure. It literally is a buckyball. And this is the structure that we see in our experiments. It makes these kind of like carbon nanotube type uh, buckyball type impressions and an arrangement of the matter around it in the brass samples that we produce, right? And so I've been saying for years, like it, it forms these tubes and these, these spheres and stuff, which have a, you know, five-sided and six-sided sections within them and branches coming off. And they are effectively, because they're a super, super fluid of electrons, they, they uh, at least that's how you initiate them. They can form um, this uh, 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 um, particular structure on the outside. And then you move them around by effectively toroidal moments and 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 uh, um, interferometry, which is interacting electromagnetic waves 
probably with what's called phase conjugation, which is where you have a wave and another wave 180 degrees out of phase. And that, that produces nodes yeah. which are effectively scalar. Um, and this is clearly uh, discussed uh, by Tom Bearden in his 1980s and 1990s work and stuff. In, for instance, this is Ferd Lance, one of his later uh, books. Okay, um, So most of the stuff is in the literature that you, you need to understand. Um, so if, if I bring up the, the paper from um, Lockheed Martin, let, let me go to my blog. So if, <laughs> you can go to my blog at remoteview.icu and you can type in uh, probably in the question you can go re uh, coherent and uh, don't share that in your chat well yeah so like well. like I, I can just pull it up here for those that don't know what oh yeah sure so uh, real quick while you're doing that get, yeah go on I wanted to ask is the azimuth the area the kind of the surround the sphere that they create with the three okay how would you describe I, I'm it? I'll, 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 I'll do it in 3D so give me a second, I'll share my screen. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to have to drag you down here. Sorry, guys. So, uh, and I'm going to share my other screen. Thank you and share then... permission. Okay, share screen here. Okay. So can you see that? No, you can't see that yet. I'll just do that. Go share. Right. Can you see that? There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now we're cooking. Yeah, go. Up. Right. So you can see this, the central spot of this cone here. Yeah? Which I'm pointing at. Can you see that? Yep. Right. Yep. That is the, yep. the point of phase singularity. That is where your electrons will come down this yep. uh, spiral. And because electrons repel each other, they will end up 180 degrees out of phase. And then at this point, they've got no space. <laughs> so they have to be become coherent. Anyway, um, and this is the point that creates the Aronhoff bomb effect. Okay. And uh, this was talked about um, by, Brit uh, by, by um, Eric Weinstein and Hal put off in uh, January or February 2022 in a presentation that's available on YouTube. And they talk about this um, Penrose stair diagram that <laughs> I also used um, to describe the Aronhoff bomb effect and then uh, uh, and the fact that that is the only thing that will allow us to break... Um, uh, it changes epsilon zero, so you can change the light speed and, and the properties of the physical vacuum to form charge. It changes the dielectric constant of the physical vacuum. And this allows you to um to to change time in here and also change uh, the speed of light and therefore you can go faster than light with the epsilon zero changed and they talk about this and then hal put off replies by saying oh yes and you can go even further than that there are all kinds of toroidal geometries that you can blah 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 and he then talks about the communication technology but anyway so it there's this you see this little ball at the back here that is the disruption zone, and the flux of the gravitational wave comes through here, through, all through the, from this point all the way down here and out through the top. Okay, now I'm going to show you this literally in 3D because I have the light wave here. <laughs> there we go. So I can actually spin this this puppy around here, and you can see our three substructures, which are exactly the same as as the key large structure. So this is what you need to produce, and when they get this close, they will create the fractal above. And so each of these cones has a, a gravitational wave that comes through. And when you are running this ordinarily, the, the, and this is the monopole. So it's, it's, it's a, a, a topological monopole. So uh, I will show that with a piece of Photoshop here. Um, uh, so this is so each, each of those ring, each of those donuts in there. I recommend would meant potentially uh, an orb. We would be seen visually. Yes, each each one of those will have the there will be their own sphere, and then when they join the gravitational waves together, they make a larger one at the quantization level above, and they literally snap to 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 that quantization level. Okay, so so here, um, if I can show you with the layers. This, in, the, in fact, I'm going to bring up the paper so you don't think I'm making it up. <laughs> this is observation of Dirac monopoles in a synthetic magnetic field. And uh, this is uh, by a bunch of people, M.W. Um, Ray, uh, and this was published in Nature. Okay, so this is what I mean by a synthetic monopole. Uh, you end up with a, a structure here, and you ha it, it, they end up looking like hedgehogs. And it's, anyway, you can read the paper. 
But here's their paper showing, and I'm going to show this diagram with the model that we derived. And the model we derived was from experiment only. No maths, no preconceptions, whatever. We just looked at what nature was doing under a microscope and I kept drawing pictures that would fit until it fitted everything. <laughs> and, and, and it ended up being this thing that is just, is just a thing of great beauty. So what we have here in, on this right-hand side is a comparison between experiment, which is everything that looks beautiful and clear, and, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, fuzzy, rather, and, and, and simulation, which is everything that looks really clear. And it says, um, experimental and simulated condensate particles. So these are Bose-Einstein condensates, densities with a monopole near the center of the condensate. Comparisons along the vertical axis are shown in rows A and B, A and uh, B, I think it's a row, sorry, A and B. This is along the, the vertical axis. Um, and those along the horizontal axis are shown in rows C and D. Okay, yeah, I mean, it depends what your perspective is, but anyway. Um, so this is essentially what these produce. And um, if I show you uh, here, and is it here? Uh, not there. Not there. I'll get there in a minute. Here, okay. So uh, this is what I showed. This is from Alto University. It's the same thing. So you have your spin horizontal, spin down, and spin up, okay? And this is the bit that glows inside that sphere, right? When you've got the, the spin change. And yeah. coming into the bottom, you have this uh, monopole point here. It's a topological monopole. It's not a real monopole, but it acts like a mono real monopole to a degree. Um, and you can, the Russians have done lots of experiments where they show these things creating these little birdie structures on, on x-rays when they're generated. Yeah. And you can generate them, by the way, by taking a cone and spinning the cone very fast. And these, these monopoles are produced, by the way. <laughs> and if you get a lot of, if you get four cones and point them to the center, you end up them aggregating in the center. And then it looks like a particular pattern by Salvatore Pi, doesn't it? Okay, anyway, um, uh, so here, you can, I can overlay this O structure here, and you'll see this is from the side, yeah. and this is from the top. And if I turn on the geometry there, that is what's going on. And it even has the, the cone bit coming in. So this is what you see in those various images, in my view, in my hypothesis. Okay? Yeah. Um, now, the interesting thing is, this is their mathematical prediction, but this is what the Bose-Eisenstein condensate looks like. And can you see, you see the S? Yeah. And the, oh, yeah, yeah. the S is there. There's a little S on there. The S is there because it's actually got the subfractal. That produces the S. That's interesting. That, that, yeah. It's a wheel within a wheel within a it, wheel. It is very interesting. So, is the model... Monopole faced in the opposite direction of where the heat signature is with that, uh, you know, I would almost uh, call it the tr um, that half circle shape that we see that the, you were showing the, a second ago. The monopole this that, this bit here. Yeah, that one there. Yeah. So where, where's the monopole there? The monopole is facing the The, the monopole is, yeah, so if you if you look, I, I've got this mapped across. So this is the, the, yep. the, the spin up, spin middle, spin down. Uh, this is above the overall structures. You can see there. Okay, so this is the non-radiating boundary. Yeah. This is the overall sphere that you see. And it fires a gravitational beam through the center. Okay, what happens with charged particles, they come in and they stop at the phase singularity here. Okay, and, and that, you don't need to power these things once you've made them. They self-power themselves. They are what's called an anapole. They, they, are, they don't radiate their energy. You can put more energy into them. <laughs> They're quite stable. Yeah. Right? So they can last for days. So how would you, so in terms of going into the videos, what we've seen in the videos with these orbs moving around, how would you define the direction of travel while looking at your 3D, your model here? How would you determine the direction of travel exactly? It, where and what would you expect it to be based so, on what so, looking at from this visualization? So, okay, let me, let me do that. There is... I, what I've got here... You have the videos, you can pull them up your side too. 
Oh, well, I, I think that your your side, your viewers ahead. have seen them, and I, I I know what you're talking about. So, um, essentially, these structures have a beam that comes out. It comes out the back further. Okay, and I'll I'll have to actually. Okay. How am I going to do this? I'm uh, I'm going to have to change my layers here so you can see. I've got this three three tall one here. Um, and I can break it down so you can see the substructures here. So I'm going to take away the, Thank you. that's the main tour there. Take away the lemon, the oh, apple yeah. and this. Okay. So here, so I've got a three sub tour structure and the sub sub tours are only made of two. Okay. Now what happens is where this disruption field interacts with the tor above you actually have a leak and the leak is reduced so in the alien reproduction vehicle they have 48 which is the maximum number you can have round and this is in just ancient stuff but anyway <laughs> oh dear oh god <laughs> yeah so the the point is is that that um uh, you have this beam and i can show it by showing the the uh I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to show uh, the normal ones and they, they have this disruption beam that comes out, okay? And yeah. it, ha it has a certain level of extension. It's perpendicular to the torus. Right? Uh, yeah, well, um, you, you'll, you'll see it in a minute. I meant Apple outer shell. Okay. So you can see here, and I'm not, I've not, this is only for a two tour structure, but like I say, you can't use two, two tour practically. You have to use three and four is pointless. You, you don't need any more yeah. than three to define yeah, a plane. Yeah. So the, the plane actually has to be within this part. So you, you cannot change where the plane's got to be. The, the plane's got to be from here in the center. What well, this is literally the Visa Pisces, and, and the, the fish bladder. It's the, the sacred geometry. The plane has to sit between this point and this point here. Okay. So, it, you know, the plane has to fit in this zone. All right, and then it can be acted upon. Okay. Um, anything within this overall, wait, sorry, anything within this overall bubble, epsilon and mu is changed. It's called the permittivity of the vacuum. Epsilon zero, rather, is changed. The permittivity of the vacuum, and so um, the speed of light and time and electric field properties will change inside this. And it's all detailed in a paper by one Kenneth Radford Shoulders from 2000. And the document is called Permittivity Transitions. Permittivity Transitions, Kenneth Radford Shoulders. Kenneth Radford Shoulders demonstrated and showed that all sparks have a ball lightning or what he calls a charge cluster and eventually called an exotic vacuum object as a leader. That doesn't matter whether it's a spark coming out of your finger or the leader that ionizes the channel from the low uh, potential to the high potential between a cloud to ground, ground to cloud or cloud to cloud lightning discharge. Okay, it's always got a ball lightning that does the, the a charge cluster that does the ionization channel first. And you can see this on extremely high field, foot, uh, speed footage of lightning. And these things will get excited and they will split up in, and produce your lightning branches. But it's only one that will hit the, the, the higher potential. And so, um, yeah, so it, do, it doesn't matter whether you've got three or whatever. So I think what I need to do is just go through a couple of papers which you need to note down and your, your followers need to read uh, and get up to speed on. Yeah, please. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> um, so, so essentially, uh, this this is a topological monopole, and we create them, and we've done a lot of that. So, the first one. Oh no, no! Before before I do this, I need to show you. <laughs> I need to show you something else. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. All right. So, uh, not here. Oh wow! Look at this. Okay. So. Let me jump. Okay. All right, I will do this here, and I will do it as a presenter view, and then I can see you. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. 
Okay, so what? I, I think when you would do your presentation a few weeks. Okay, ago. so so basically, this is twenty three. If you have twenty four, that's half of a circle. That's forty eight. That is what we, I observed by looking at this particular sample by John Hutchison in twenty twenty that was synthesized in two thousand and seven. Okay, so on here I found several quantization levels on there using a uh, fairly cheap microscope. Um, okay. These things do not care about electric and magnetic fields. This is a high magnetic electric field in Hank Uren's experiment. These are actually the same kind of thing, these little plasma balls. They don't need to be luminous like this to this level. You can see a less luminous one up here. Okay, and you can see an almost unluminous one here. Okay, but these ones are luminous. So you can have ranges of luminosity on the outside. They produce these. This is a coherent matter wave here, and it's two things orbiting around each other. Sometimes we see three, and sometimes we see more. This is effectively the same things as you're seeing, but already in the next quanta up um, that you're seeing going on with the the plane, in my view. So it comes out of Winston Bostick's work. He was charged in 1948 to make a fusion technology that was practical out of the the thermonuclear bomb and he worked on project sherman uh, sorry project uh, sherwood as part of the uh, atomic energy commission and he worked at los alamos and uh, princeton university and so forth and he shot toroids of plasma okay and this is deuterated titanium and he does a discharge 10000 amps incredibly small amount of time it produces a plasma loop which has a current going through it which reconnects and forms a torus that gets passed over a magnetic field and it forms a tori of tori that is the structure that's the basic structure and um, this is talking about non-radiating boundary. People can look at these peer-reviewed papers in Nature Materials, and you can also download the book uh, EV, A Tale of Discovery, um, which is five years after Ken Shoulders. So who is Ken Shoulders? Ken Shoulders is the guy that was brought in, in my view, by the CIA um, to investigate John Hutchison's work from 1979. So he came in in 1982. Fi five years later, he published, he was awarded several patents. Go and look at them. The way that he creates these exotic vacuum objects is the same way that Lockheed Martin claimed they create without crediting Ken Shoulders in their 2013 patent, right? Go figure. Um, and and it, it says here, these... These waves can be thought of as longitude waves in the vacuum. They are largely undetectable by standard electromagnetic detecting means, but are readily accessible in the monopole world. This is 1987. There appears to be an incredibly large number of useful phenomena yet to arise from using potential effects that are not immediately accessible to electromagnetic fields. This is vector and scalar potential. What happens with these structures, this most simpler one, this is an anapole. It was discovered in 1954 by Zeldovich. Okay, you have toroidal currents here um which uh, uh sorry you have a magnetic field going around these poloidal currents they oscillate and you have a poloidal sorry an electric oscillating field this is the most simplest one and the fields cancel at a distance and you only get the vector and scalar potentials outside okay so these things quantize and they are self contained structures and if you pump energy into here you can keep pumping energy into here until all forms of matter will decay now you don't need, when you have a fractal toroidal structure, and this is published in a 2017 paper in a major peer-reviewed journal, you do not need these oscillating components. It will self-organize into a non-radiating uh, plasmoid structure. Okay, This is in Nature Materials, and it's d basically describing the same thing as was described by Ken Shoulders 30 years previously. So do you think they didn't do anything? with Ken Shoulders doing these patents and, you know, no, I think they did a lot. Um, yeah. uh, here, here's a th third order structure keep with, that. sorry, what? All right, keep going. So, okay. Uh, no, you can keep going. Yeah. After you're kind of done with this part, because it's very interesting. It goes back to what you were, maybe what you're showing here, where you matter. Yeah. Uh, it goes back to the videos if you want to address that. I remember I was watching your prediction a couple of weeks ago, and one thing that I thought was interesting, there's two possibilities, is that 
This is either some type of teleportation or some type of annihilation event. And early on, I was all about thinking it was an annihilation event. But I ruled that out because I thought, well, since E equals F squared, this mass has to go there. Our zap must have been a lot okay, I... if it was uh, an annihilation event. I'm wondering, can you correct my understanding of that? Or Okay, so, yeah, I think it, you've asked the question, so let's address that now. One, um, yeah. when, when this matter is condensing, it releases two killer electron volt photons. They are not thermal photons right <laughs> um and so you don't see them in ir but the energy is di dissipated secondly when if you get to the point where uh, you get unification of the forces and so if you go and look at a patent by mikhail solin which was awarded uh, in the uh, ussr actually not in the soviet republics so it's 1992 for his quantum coherent nuclear reactor he fires an electron beam into a, a low vapor pressure metal and it forms these solitons of opposite magnetic charges that form clusters in, in spheres or tubes. And inside there, you get unification of the forces and decay of baryons. What are baryons? That's a neutron or a proton in a nucleus. And the baryons can decay into light and leptons. What do I mean by that? Light? Well, you know what light is, but light doesn't necessarily need to be thermal. It can also be gamma rays, it can be X-rays, it can be extra low frequency ray, rays, none of which you can see in the visual or, or the... But if you have X-rays coming out, they will excite air molecules around it and they will produce photons in the visible spectrum, which are still not thermal, right? Okay, so and then leptons can be either charged or uncharged leptons. A charged lepton is an electron, a muon, or a tauon, or the, the uncharged leptons is electron neutrino, muon neutrino, or tau, tau neutrino. You can have a vast amount of energy released without any explosion because it's an implosion event and then it releases what the Russians call field forms of matter. And I'll give you an example. There's a guy called Mahadevan Srinivasan. He worked at the Babaratomic Research Center. About 20 years ago, he was given data from an electric arc furnace in India. And they had three, something like meter-wide graphite electrodes, something like 11 megawatts going in. So you've got three. Interesting, it's three. Anyway, there's three of these going into what's called a ferrosilicon furnace. And what they were chucking into this was scrap iron, sand, and uh, coke, you know, like uh, charcoal. And what they got out of it was iron silicon alloy, ferrosilicon alloy. What they found was, in a, it's a continuous process. You can't start, stop this because once you stop it, it everything's set solid, right? So you can't. You have to keep it going for eleven weeks. They produced three tons of excess silicon and one ton of extra excess iron per day, right, for 11 weeks. And if you work that out, it's something like 350 tons, which is the mean weight of an A300 or an A300 ER, whatever it is, the bigger one, right? And you know what? There isn't a massive hole in the middle of India. And if, if you take, where's the silicon coming from? Well, if you take carbon and oxygen and you fuse them, you end up with silicon. 12, 16, 28, right? So they were doing fusion using intense electric energy, which will, whether you like it or not, it will create these vortical flows. If you've got three electrodes in there, it's going to do some stuff. Like the, this one's going to spin around here because you've got an electric arc and then you've got, um, a magnetic field spinning around there's going to be spinning here spinning here and spinning here it's going to be creating these same things because you've got hydrodynamic shear when i say that it's in the fluid of the metals which all got in a plasma kind of state because the electrons are not associated with any particular nuclei you're going to get these structures forming so it's unsurprising so you don't have necessarily a nuclear bomb like effect you don't need to have that we do experiments and and it appears that we're synthesizing elements but the, the world isn't ending because what happens is when you form these coherent matter structures, the nuclear reactions occur inside. And when the coherent matter structure collapses, well, they just pop out. 
and I can show you what happens because there's even photos of it. And I'm going to show you right now. Yeah. I'm going to show you in uh, yeah. in a, a paper by um, it's a book. I have the book here, which I, I remastered. It's it's the um, Steps to the Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse by Takaaki Matsumoto. Sadly, he died earlier this year. I did get to visit him just before he died. And the the key phrase in here, which I must read before I show you an example of what happens in these spheres, and we've replicated what he showed. Far in the universe, nuclear collapses very often take place by the gravitational force after stars consume their fuel. And that'd be when the black hole happens, right? Since the electromagnetic force is about 40 orders of magnitude stronger than the gravitational force, it should be easy to induce similar nuclear collapses by electromagnetic force in laboratory. But we never knew now, uh, never knew until now how to do that. Recently, the author discovered a nuclear collapse which was induced by the electromagnetic force in laboratory during study of the mechanisms of so-called cold fusion phenomena. Several kinds of nuclear reaction which were directly induced by the electromagnetic force called electronuclear reactions were found so far to occur in a special state of hydrogen clusters called itonic clusters. This is his idea or micro ball lightning. The nuclear collapse was one of the most remarkable reactions among ENRs called electronuclear collapse, ENC. Furthermore, very amazingly, uh, completely broken materials by ENC were found to be regenerated again to thin tubes and films of content conventional elements such as carbon, oxygen and iron. The latter process was called electronuclear regeneration. So, you can push this so hard that all of the matter is converted to field forms of matter. And there's a guy called Kladoff and he actually did this between... 1999 and 2002 using sound cavitation converted completely destroyed matter converting it into just waves so we observe things disappearing John Hutchison observed things disappearing inside of the metals here in 1990 uh, 1990 I think it is published here in fusion technology, the American Journal of Fusion Technology, using palladium electrodes loaded with deuterium, Matsumoto cut them in half. And do you know what he found inside? The material had disappeared in spherical sections that started along the grain boundaries, like this, and grew and then consumed entire crystals. And he calls these, ultimately, microball lightning. Here, he describes the process here how it occurs and the reason is is because you get co a concentration of electrons and and uh, hydrogen atoms uh, at the bank grain boundaries and you end up forming these clusters okay the same thing occurred with uh, John Hutchison and if ultimately if it's forming if it's consuming the whole crystal grain boundary inside where is the matter going well, if it goes into electromagnetic waves or it goes into neutrinos, it can leave the matter and you don't even see it. You don't see it. So, um, go on. Yeah, go on. Um, so I think there are two quick questions on from topic here is that, so there's a zap where there's a flash when we see in our, our MH370 videos, at least in the satellite video. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that might be indicative of this type of process? A follow-up question would be, how much energy do you think would be required to induce the singularity that we see? Very little, because it's self-feeding. Once once you get it going, it does itself. So let, let me, um, uh, I can show you a so video. Amplifying it, is it able to amplify it and ramp up? Is that, is that a good understanding, or how would you describe it? So here's the thing. If you have a bubble in which you change the ability of electric fields to form what is an atom an atom is a nucleus let's say it's a little thing in the middle and on the outside you've got a whole bunch of electrons right now the electrons are kept to the, the electrons are attracted to the positive nucleus aren't they yeah they, because you've got positive charge in the nucleus because you've got some protons forget about the neutrons they don't help right You've got the electrons on the outside. They are attracted. But what stops the electrons collapsing into the center? Well, they repel each other, right? 
So there's a happy equilibrium that they form. Okay. Now imagine you change epsilon zero, the ability of the uh, uh, the dielectric constant of the physical vacuum. These things can now the, the charge doesn't work in the same way. <laughs> so they can cl collapse in, and if they get all the way into the middle, you get electronuclear collapse. The new, the electrons become part of all of the protons because in every atom that ever was. You ha always have an electron with every proton. It's like the simplest one is hydrogen, you know, protium. It has a proton and an electron, eee, like that, right? If you have deuterium, it's a, it's a proton and two neutrons. You still only have one electron. So for every proton, you have an electron, whatever atom you're looking at. The ones you're made of, the one the plane's made of, the one the lithium ions are batteries are made of, the toothpaste in someone's, everything's got, for every atom, new proton, there is an electron. Yeah. So if you change the dielectric constant, then and the electrons can't repel each other in the same way they do well, they collapse in on the nucleus and it becomes a collapsed object a fully collapsed object and you're going to see this when i show john archibald's comment comment you're going to see you everything you need to know is in that short comment to explain what you're observing now I, if you wish i can show you a video of what happens when an exotic vacuum object goes because we've got it on video and you'll see that it looks a lot like you see in your videos uh, let me let me do this. Uh, it's one of the first videos I shared on my blog. Um, sure. Um, and the crazy thing is, um, when these things blow up, uh, they actually leave a cold thing. So what happens when when the matter is collapsing in? And this happens at electronic speeds. People people can't conceive of the speed at which these kind of reactions occur. They they happen so fast. It's it's mind boggling, right? You you think when a hydrogen bomb goes off, it goes from nothing to like a big freaking thing that's miles wide in a blink of an eye. Well, look at how fast they claimed that the 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 universe went from something the size of a pea to something the size which is unfathomably big. That that is kind of when when you're talking about these reactions, they can occur to all intents and purposes instantly. Okay, and there are many things going on at the same time. So I'm going to share this uh, one, if I can drag this down. And it's called Evo Blaster. Um, and you can see it here. So I don't, I don't, oh, I need to actually share, don't I? <laughs> that would help. <laughs> you can't see, the people on my channel can see. <laughs> Let me share that uh, here. Okay, so essentially what you have is you have these flashes and then you have a cold yeah. zone left over, right? Um, and so this is an exotic vacuum object, but it, 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 it's, it's reached the point at which it's now detonating. And, and so if you look at Matsumoto's work, uh, he talks about on page 91 um, that when the black hole explodes, the explosion of a black hole here, you get a carbon film forming, but you also get this wormhole and the, the matter comes out somewhere else and is reborn as other elements in, in electronuclear regeneration. I can, I can show you, actually, because I have it somewhere here. <laughs> the biggest mess ever. <laughs> um, mm. So real quick, in that scenario, though, it's, it's matter is coming out somewhere else, right? So, yes. So for something that's the size of a 777, shouldn't there be some byproduct somewhere? Yeah, but it might be in the middle of the Earth, and it might be in some galaxy far, far away. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, I get it. Yeah, so it could be somewhere else that we're not seeing, basically. I, I prefer the second option, which is using the 1979, the same year that I saw these balls in the sky, propulsion technology that was proposed mm -hmm. to NASA by A.C. Holt which has the fractal toroidal structure in there. Um, 
but before we go though, I just want to close this out by showing you this diagram on uh, nine, page 91 here. So you can, you can see it a little bit clearer here. So this is his concept, having studied a lot of petit, particular pieces of material. You have this zone at which the explosion spans out to. Um, and that's the point of electronuclear collapse and then through the wormhole and you have the emission from the white hole. So it may well be that this will go down to ground and it, and whatever was originally in the matter, it's now inside the Earth. And the, the, I heard about the eruption of the white hole is very interesting. Uh, we, I was talking about that with Salvatore Pius. And just real quick on that, just a side note, you don't have to look into it. What do you think for Pius and his work? Is that you think it, uh, you know, it's similar to your work? Do you think it, it, there's differences? What, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's definitely well researched. I, I, I don't know how original it is. Um, I do know that in 2017, when I, I realized I had to either walk away from this science or actually because of the implications of what I was finding or move forward. And I only moved forward because it was obvious to me that this had been weaponized and it was only going to be used to subjugate humanity. And so um, yeah. I, I, and I thought I will take a full on reputation hit. I don't care. Uh, I have no choice uh, uh, for various reasons, which I've explained in the past. I knew I would always have to do this and, and that it wouldn't be something anyone would be particularly happy with me doing. And I, and, uh, and I will say on your podcast for the first time, when, just before I released what, uh, a particular presentation, I looked into the camera and I deliberately looked like I'd lost my mind, but it, I was acting. <laughs> it, it was to gain a bit of buzz, right? And But the point was, is it, genuinely, I was also in shock as well, so it was easy to do. Um, but I, I said, you know, uh, I, I don't know how these people can sleep at night knowing what that they've done and, and that they're hiding this from humanity. Uh, and you know who they are. And I said, yeah. you have got a few years to come clean with this. And that was in gen that was in March 2017. I said, you better come out and, and be public about this because it's going to come out now. It's going to come out. And one of the particular parties I was referring to was the US Navy. And that's the first time I've said it. It's absolutely crystal clear that they've had this technology. And the evidence is already there in the record. Long time probably too. So the other thing is about um, uh, Salvatore Pi. I've already done a presentation where, like, I, I went visited the Hutchison lab, which is in a secret location in Germany, the, his previous lab, uh, which has been reconditioned and stuff, and they're waiting to operate it, um, having the skill to do it. And um, if I just stop sharing for the minute, um, and uh, in in there, there was a sample. And I pull it, and this is from this is before the Pi uh, patents were released. And I pulled it off the shelf, and I said, "What I believe is going on here is there is a piezoelectric material, and the electromagnetic waves interact with this aluminium block and, and form uh, phase conjugation and coherence in here. And uh, this is the basis of what's going on that's producing the Hutchison effect." The reason I said that is because in the late 1950s and published in New Scientist in 1963, they showed using a, a piezoelectric material called quartz, which I referred to earlier in a number of different cases, um, they used a magnetron to produce uh, electromagnetic waves. That goes into the piezoelectric material, which can convert the electromagnetic waves into phonons at the frequency of the electromagnetic wave and it travels down the the quartz it comes off the other far side and reflects back and you get these little blips as the sound which is at the frequency of let's say 2.45 gigahertz that's the sound it's sound but it's weird to think about it it, it, it likes like so ultrasound it's unbelievable and what they found is that if you go to 10 gigahertz you actually start getting sound which is at the same frequency, or rather, in uh, same periodicity as the interatomic spacing. Okay, and this leads to you be able to create phase conjugation at each atom nucleus. And because the, as I said earlier, the electrons have a relationship with the nucleus, right? The, the, the nucleus is held within a sh shield of electrons. If you squish that 
on the electrons because you've got a phonon coming through, a sound wave, it's going to affect the nucleus. So you're going to get standing waves right in there. And so what this means is you can make coherent matter. Now, what would be the best choice of element to make coherent matter from? Well, it would be one with a single isotope. What is that? It's aluminium. That is what is in the Salvatore Pius. He puts P PZT, lead zirconium titanate, a piezoelectric material on the outside of aluminium, a, a monoisotope. He then heats it with pulses of electromagnetic waves. Why is that doing what it's doing? It's creating room temperature superconductivity because it's converting that single element isotope by using sound waves, which are effectively scalar, at the interatomic spacing, it gets them all into phase. And when you have all of the same matter wave in phase, the whole thing becomes superconducting. And it was published in 1963. Now you've got a superconductor. So, uh, and I agree. Yeah, I think that a lot of Salvatore Pius is, is, uh, his patents, is obviously, you know, it, it leaves on all types of science that's been Of course it has to. So, it, well, you've you, got that yeah. superconductor. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Uh, I was just going to say, you've got the superconductor now, so is that how, is that like kind of um, the, the mechanism by which all the rest of this is possible? You, the thing so is... What leads from, if one leads to the other, how does that work? Okay, so 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 let let me get the Lockheed Martin pattern. It's the right time to bring it in now. Um, um, sure. Yeah, I'm gonna. Am I sharing my screen or am I? What, what's happening here? I'm, I'm not sharing my screen at the moment. That's okay. So uh, you're not sharing. No. That's okay. There you go. Yeah. All right. So I need. Uh, is it? Is it down there? Okay. So. If you go to my blog at remoteview.icu and go to um, just type in coherent, probably that'll do it, maybe. There, it's the first blog article, public blog article. And uh, it's the Aronhoff bomb effect, or the bomb Aronhoff effect, and how it relates to the. So here it is, it's called Systems and Methods for Generating Coherent Matter Waves. There we go. United States Patent. This is probably one of the most important patents here, uh, understanding this. So this is uh, filed December the 28th, 2011, okay? And it was prior published on July the 4th, 2013. <clears throat> and so here you've got a magnetic field, you've got some micro cavities here, you've got a cathode which is emitting charge clusters in exactly the same way sorry am I sh I'm not sharing my screen am I so I I'm talking to myself <laughs> okay so here it is okay. have your other one up I'm watching your screen at the same time okay you're all right <laughs> cunning um so here it is this is systems and methods for generating coherent okay. matter wave beams okay uh there's the file December the 28th 2011 and it was first published July the 4th 2013 okay uh uh, I think it, the date of patent here, I think that maybe this is awarded uh, 22nd, 2016. I only ever saw it in 2017 or when we're 18 or something. Anyway, they emit um, electrons via uh, spike electrodes with a, a, a pulse. This is exactly the way that was done by Tesla, and it was exactly the way that was done by Tesla in his electrical particles of matter uh, weapon uh, as described uh, shortly before he died and this is um, the way that Ken Shoulders did it. They pass through a magnetic field with these re coupled resonant cavities and this forces coherence along with the magnetic field and you get a coherent matter wave, right? And they, th this is the moment that, that was the aha for me. Firstly, this is the structure, yeah. right? Okay. And this is a ball of coherent matter. <laughs> okay. Um, so they they talk about how you can create. So furthermore, unlike laser beams, the Bose-Einstein condensate, e.g., a form of coherent matter wave, the subject technology may produce coherent matter waves that allow both fermions and bosons to achieve coherence. Okay. According to various aspects of the subject technology, a, a system for generating coherent matter wave beam is provided. The system comprises of a plurality of beam generating units disposed. Each each uh, uh, of the plurality of beam generating units configured generates a stream of charged particles. 
uh, and so on. Um, okay. According to various aspects of the subject technology, intense direct, uh, directed coherent matter wave beams are particles for bosons, e.g. particles with integer spins, or fermions, e.g. particles with half integer spins, neutral or charged may be produced. So basically there's no restriction. The energy stored in these beams may have virtually zero entropy, allowing for experimental physics with unexplored territories. Coherence in matter waves, uh, in particular in fermions, fermions, may be beyond the reach of conventional technologies unless the temperature can be reduced to near zero. However... In this, even this approach may only work for bosons using conventional technologies, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then it goes on to explain, you can read it yourself, but it goes on to explain that in this technology, you do not need to have near absolute zero. It can be at any temperature, only in the, as I was describing in the early part of this. But I want to talk about the applications here. Furthermore, coherent matter waves may allow fermions, electrons, as well as boson to achieve coherence. Examples, Example applications. I'm going to zoom in right here because this is the money shot. All right, well, I mean, maybe it's not going to let me, but because oh, I'm in the, there, it doesn't matter. Examples applications for coherent matter wave beams may include single bath thermal energy extraction. What is this? This is ex it, like sucking energy out of an area in free space where you couldn't ordinarily do it. Normally you need a temperature differential to capture energy, right? Using this, you can literally, it's like a back hole. <laughs> you can suck energy out of something. Th th this is a terrible weapon, actually, but um, in all by itself. Ultra-sensitive accelerometers, interferometric uh, tracking of air and spacecrafts. You can literally move this to track these objects, okay? In very difficult things that you can't track in any other way. A more accurate alternative to global positioning systems, matter wave projectiles. Wow. Right? And this is not... So is that a teleportation? Or is that something different? What do you think? Well, how would you define matter wave projectile? This is a ball of intense clustered energy that you can fire. Huh. And, and because it has uh, its own substructure that allows it to be in its own space time you it, it, it loses its mass and inertia and so you can accelerate if you leave it with a little bit of negative charge you can use so ken Scholz has described how just using 240 volts from your domestic power socket you can accelerate a whole incredible volume of energy to one tenth of the speed of light just with the field generated by a normal electric socket you don't need a huge linear accelerator okay because the mass is completely removed and the, the inertia is removed okay yeah um huh. missiles you don't need a ton of power right no you don't you, you can accelerate something phenomenally fast with a low field okay um ma uh not only matter wave projectiles and missiles, directed energy weapons. Notice that's different from matter wave projectiles and missiles. Directed energy. So what you can do is, in my presentation at Stichin, I showed uh, what cold electricity is. It's a cluster, a toroidal cluster of electrons in this condensed state, which then is guided down a wire. So this was shown, and it's in Bearden's book, it was shown to Bearden in 1992 in Moscow. Right, using an eight micron wire, you can transmit 25 kilowatts of power. And what is happening is the structure is guided down the wire by um, the field and it carries far more energy, but the energy is in a pseudo superconducting state relative to the wire. Isn't the wire is just the guide. Now, there's another way you can make a wire you can make a wire by using a laser to ionize air, and then the charge cluster travels down the ionized air channel as a wire, a virtual wire. So that is your uh, uh, directed energy weapons, okay? You can you can direct, but there's also other ways you can do it. You can, so Ken Shoulders talks about uh, fluidized electrons, which we have created. You can send those fluidized electrons to somewhere. They can go into the metal, and then you can direct what happens to them. You can get them to detonate all in one go and sh shred them a thing, or you can get them to destabilize and turn the metal to jelly. There's all kinds of different ways you can manipulate them. This is like, it's, it's, it's like magic, and you send off the package of things that you can then ask it to do various things with, right? 
MatterWave Optics, so with MatterWave Optics, you can literally change the um, uh, the uh, di the dielectric, not dielectric properties, the um, refractive pro properties of an area of space. So you can create a virtual lens in the sky. You know, if you wanted to lend sunlight, for instance, you could literally create a, a, a lens that's not physical. You've just literally created a lens in the sky. <laughs> so I always remember burning, burning, what do you call it, um, uh, ants when I was a kid. I, I got I got over it. I felt too guilty even with an ant dying. But, like, they were quite annoying. There was a lot of them. <laughs> Appar apparently they're, like, one-tenth of the ma all bio, all animal bio life on Earth is ants. So, you know, I've kind of got to turn, come to terms with my... Uh, killing ants but um yeah, yeah you can use the sun a, a, a magnifying glass to just burn ants and so you could in theory create a uh, a a virtual lens in in a free volume of the atmosphere to you know direct sunlight as it were in the same way that i think the greeks or some ancient civilization used mirrors to burn ships they would have these big copper mirrors or something and they would point them all on one ship and they would set light to it right um cloaking you can use this for yeah. cloaking, right? So you can you can track a cruise missile and then make it cloaked, right? Matter wave emissions and propulsion, propulsion in there yeah. using this matter wave That's soliton. The part's getting me. Oh, I know, and then I'm going to show you how it's done. Uh, matter wave solitons, yeah. high energy collisions, and high precision matter optics, atomic loss text tests for physical contents and other suitable applications. This is the money shot there. This is kind of a, a rough idea of where you might want to use it. But it's the, the applications are mind boggling, mind boggling. It's literally a whole new era in science. Just, and this is 2011 this was submitted, just as Ken Shoulders said in 1987. In 1987, okay? So um, I'm going to th throw a couple of papers at you right now. So this is Force-Free Time Harmonic Plasmoids by Jack Nachamkin. And he is at the Phillips Laboratory Propulsion Directorate at the Air Force Material Command, Edwards Air Force Base. And this is from 1992. It's a fairly long paper, but you can get it free. It's uh, uh, publicly available. And it talks about these structures. A hereforto unexplored solution of Maxwell's equations is investigated for time harmonic waves, in particular ionized gas. The analysis is focused on the spherically symmetric cases that behave like electromagnetic energy trapped in the form of a plasmoid. Okay, you're going to hear the word plasmoid a lot. Okay, it will be shown that a critical frequency exists below which the current cannot be carried by electrons and the plasmoid remains stable. Resonant sizes will be shown to exist such at that the plasmoid will not exchange energy with their external surroundings. You can build these things, you can eject them, and they're not going to dissipate any energy at all, wherever they go. You can get energy in there, there's ways to get energy in there, but once you've made these things, they're in their own little bubble of space-time. And their boundary conditions can be met by vacuum solutions to Maxwell's equations. Virial analysis calculates free charge density, blah, blah, blah. What do they look like? Well, firstly, under different conditions, they may have names like anomalous discharges, charge clusters, and ball lightning. Huh. I'm telling you this is what it is. Now... What happened to Matsumoto is he was happily publishing in the American Nuclear Society's Journal of Fusion Technology until 1993 when he started correlating this phenomena with ball lightning. Then they changed the rules, preventing him from being able to publish. Then the Air Force, under J.R.R. Roth, in the following year, it was actually it was sub submitted and I think it was published in May 1995, submitted a paper that said ball lightning can teach us about fusion technology. And if we can create a 10 millimeter ball lightning, it would provide all the energy for a home. That was in fusion technology after they'd prevented him from talking about ball lightning. Now, Ken Shoulders was asked, we, we tried to publish his thing in our field. Our field is condensed matter nuclear science. 
Ken Shoulders was prevented. From, sorry. A guy that worked at Los Alamos National Laboratory demanded the curator of the library of files on cold fusion called atlenacana.org to remove Ken Shoulders work from the database. And I never heard of Ken Shoulders exotic vacuum objects slash ball lightning work or Matsumoto's work until I mentioned them for the first time in 2017, since I started working in the field from 2012. It's crazy. So this is ball lightning. And what does it look like? It's a sphere like that. This is, they don't know about the... In 1992, they didn't know or understand in, in the West about the internal structure. And it forms this spherical object, which is at quantized level. The maths is in here to, to show the, the stable quantization levels. And it tells you about what's on the skin of the plasmoid. Um... Uh, and you know the the superfluid nature of it. So here we here we go. There's a couple of images, look spherical plasmoid, uh, matching the pla sorry figure two matching plasmoid boundary conditions at the surface of the plasmoid. The electric and magnetic fields are parallel and tangential to the surface. This can be exactly matched by the external vacuum fields. So they're stable structures. Once you make these things, they can fly through water. They can th fly through the air. They can fly through space. Okay. Now you stay able, right? Pretty much just go, go and do whatever you want for any period of time, right? So you could deploy it, you could have it just float around, have it being controlled, and it's gonna be perfectly stable. Uh, so our understanding is so um I'll I'll I'll, sh I'll show you a slide from my presentation and then it'll help me to help you understand how this thing can be stable. So I need to go here. It's not that one, is it? Win Windows, that one. And then I need to go... Uh, present to view. Okay. And I want not that slide. I want... So th this is what I was talking about, the, the Penrose stairs. Okay, going round and going round. This is a face singularity in the center here. You're not actually going up or down. And you get that with a Mobius strip and you get that there and this is what i was talking about single bar thermal extraction that is a mobius strip in there and uh, it's extracting thermal energy at a distance from here okay and this 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 is fusing matter because it's yin force so it's not as bright as destroying matter the yang the yang makes a brighter flash because it converts most of the energy but it pro yeah. still projects out to a different place okay anyway um what i was going to show you was uh what was i going to show you <laughs> uh, what was I going to show you? <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. So I'm asking about because so I'm kind of going back to the videos in terms of the balls and the yeah. So so here here, here you are here you are here you are. So in the top left there, you have the basic structure. It's a torus with a magnetic um, pseudo monopole and and the electrons coming in or the ions coming into this phase singularity where it can't okay. go out here. This is the overall fractal structure. Yeah. And I then showed, I then found this in Hank Uren's experiment. This was the first one we found many, many since. And this is the collapsed matter wave function. Wow. Okay. Uh, and it's calcium oxide. Calcium and oxygen and calcium oxide are all paramagnetic. They can all live inside this highly magnetic structure. But outside it has um, copper here and uh, carbon here these are all diamagnetic they cannot go across the the boundary uh, because they get repelled by the intense magnetic force at the at, at the boundary okay now i showed these three to the russians that i have a regular meeting with and they immediately sent back this and this is an image from a paper but in the biology of life by a guy called Jverblis. And Jverblis was invited because he was interested in DNA and the coils of coils and, and how you could make some... Because a DNA is a coil of a coil of a coil of a coil, right? He thought that if he started making complex coils, he could interact somehow with DNA. And so this word got about, and so he was invited into this Moscow basement in 1988 and shown this technology which looked like you see here, where I've got my mouse. And what they did is they put 30 hertz AC through this, and they showed on a Fluxgate magnetometer an AC magnet a magnetic wave in the center of this structure. And then what they did is they turned off the power, and it still persisted. And then what they did is they moved the device 
where the center of it was had this AC magnetic waveform, they moved it over to the side and in the free space that it was left behind, it still had the magnetic AC waveform. And that this persists for two days, even when the power's turned off. And so he thought, well, this is crazy. You're obviously pulling some trick on me. I don't believe that this is real. So he went to Nevesky and I've tr translated both of these papers on my blog. And he published, although it was confirmed in 1992, sorry, in 1988, he only published after the end of the Soviet Union in 1992 in the, the peer-reviewed journal Electricity. And essentially what he found was, using standard Mag Maxwell equations, if you have current going round in a loop, you produce a magnetic vector through the azimuth. If you have these and you rotate them 90 degrees and put a loop of those, you have a magnetic loop with an electric field going through the azimuth. If you take that structure and you rotate it 90 degrees and put those in a loop, you have now another electric loop with a magnetic field. And this can go on indefinitely. That is exactly what I described in 2020, having derived this structure from looking at impact marks on the John Hutchison sample. John Hutchison being the same guy that Ken Shoulders developed car charge clusters from. Okay? And so um, what they found was... was you just showed there. Was that what you said? The fract this is fractal toroidal this is fractal toroidal yeah so like here here is the basic fractal toroidal structure and what happens was i looked at the se this microscope image and i found different quantization levels so this rotate that 90 degrees and you get this structure this is the apple core running through the center and if i take that structure and i'm looking at it from the top i see it here now that one if i take that and i rotate that 90 degrees i ended up with 48 divisions around here and that's how i got to this structure and then we saw them as impact marks. This, this, this is four, this is six, this is more. So we see these structures, and these are clap structures. This is uh, um, 36, this would be 48 if it was a full tour. Um, this is three in the subtour here, and this is three in the subtour here. Okay, so these created uh, this structure. And so what it is, if you have electromagnetic, and it, sorry, if you have current going through a wire, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop share right now because it's just easier to do it with my arms, right? <laughs> um, sure. If you have electricity going through a wire, the pointing vector comes off and the energy is dissipated. If you're going go, going through a coil, the pointing vector comes off and it's dissipated. If you have a coil wrapped into a coil then the pointing vector comes off and dissipates. But if you have a coil, in a coil, in a coil, then the pointing vector goes into a loop. And so none of the energy is dissipated. And you can keep putting energy in and it gets trapped in a vacuum current. Now the word vacuum, the phrase vacuum current comes from, this was established by Nevesky in 1988, published in 1992 and released to the West when they, they the, the Soviets threw in the towel when I sent them these three images. <laughs> um, basically, um, if you have a coil of a coil of a coil of a coil, that then has a loop of pointing vector there and a loop of pointing vector there at 90 degrees. And if one collapses, it re-energizes the other one and vice versa. And so you have a stable exotic vacuum object. It's a energy concentrated at a point in space-time which doesn't require any physical matter at all. And it can be... Now, David Freiberger at the SLAC, Stanford Linear Accelerator, he calculated independently the same thing that Nevesky did three decades er or two decades earlier or whenever, in 2009, when he was trying to explain ball lightning floating around in the superconducting cavity inside a national lab in the US. And he calculated that the energy concentration caused by this uh, standard Maxwell equation derived phenomena could lead to uh, vacuum decay. That is to say, it would knock a baryon off its reference to the Dirac C and it would fall apart and the, and the baryon would just fall apart. Okay, so I'm sorry to say, and by the way, this is what one looks like when you make it. So thank you to Cosmic Day for making one in the U in the UK. So here you can see you have a coil wrapped into a coil that's wrapped into a coil. There we go. He, he developed a winding machine to make these things. These are a weapon. They put them on parabolic dishes and then project them.
That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that's all I know. So I've not seen it. What, you were showing Pat earlier. That's how you can enable all all those functionalities that we were seeing there. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I'm go I'm going to describe this. So I, look here. I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. Uh, share screen, and we'll go here, and I will do uh, that one. Uh, that one. Yeah. Share. Right, can you see my screen again? Yeah. Okay. I think it's starting right now. So, um, around that, yeah, um, okay. yeah, around that ball lightning section that was cut, this disappeared. This in a flash disappeared. Right. I, 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 you can go and look on the on the MFMP's YouTube channel, Martin Fleischman Memorial Project's YouTube channel. You can see the beautiful pattern that the coherent matter creates as it bores it's like loads of tubes running through the copper um and and next to it is the the copper is not melted even slightly it's like scalloped out it's incredible to see right but just on the boundary you have these fractal toroidal structures of different orders of um n level n minus one level tors so on this one you have two making the structure and you can see the material in the center has disappeared <laughs> here you've got three and in the center you've got this like um paisley pattern and the material in the center has disappeared here you've got four and you've got the material in the center and it's disappeared okay so in each case here you'll get you you only need three as i said because two you can't define a plane from and you know, Bostic was the work that, that I told you about Bostic trying to make the fusion. Here are his impact marks uh, published in 1980. And he says a D4D ring with spokes under the surface. It's the same thing. This is what it is. Now, in a paper which I will show you here. Um, uh, have I got it? Hopefully I've got it. Uh, yes. This is the 1979 paper uh, by A.C. Holt called Field Resonant Propulsion Concept. And by the way, in this paper, it lists every single thing that you've seen supposedly disclosed about the behavior of, uh, of uh, uh, unidentified aerial objects in recent congressional testimony. You can go and read it in this document from 1979. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and I, I literally mean that. <laughs> so the speculative propulsion, yeah, the speculative propulsion concept described in this paper was presented at a special session of the fifteenth joint, these guys, propulsion conference in June the eighteenth to twentieth, nineteen seventy nine. Propulsion concepts for galactic spacecraft. This concept was developed as a result of private, unofficial research. NASA is not involved in the UFO, in UFO research. We've got to clarify this because NASA doesn't want to be involved with that. Okay. However, the research which, which may be stimulated by this paper could be, uh, result in the verification of the essential elements of this concept and the feasibility studies concerning the development of a new generation of NASA spacecraft. Okay. Uh, electromagnetic waveforms, gravitational waveforms, or space-time metrics. The propulsion system utilizes recent research associated with magnetic field line merging, hydromagnetic wave effects, and free electron lasers. Laser generation of megagauss fields. Okay. So it talks about alpha waves and, you know, properties of the Earth here. But here is the money shot. This is the money shot. This. I think you might be sharing the wrong. Am I? I'm not sure. Oh, am I? Let me try that again. Yeah, I think so. Sorry. This one. This is the money shot. Can you see it? No problem. Yeah, it should be coming up here in a second. Can you, can you see a Taurus with uh, things? Maybe. There it is. Yep. Now I can see it. Yep. Yep. Okay. So this is a current loop, 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 a current loop. That makes a magnetic yeah. loop. That makes a toroidal moment. This is a real thing. You can go and look it up on Wikipedia what a toroidal moment is. Now, look at the magnetic field line reconnections. They connect and end up producing yeah. a magnetic vortex in the center. And that creates your phase singularity that allows for coherence at the center point. Now, what's going around that plane is one of the three of these. 
actually not 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 what because they didn't know what a toroidal moment was in 1979 it wasn't verified in the west until 1997 right so they were so far behind the soviets okay but this comes to my second hope not that the matter is destroyed like we seem to be able to do re fairly readily in a range of cold fusion experiments and our own experiments and they've caught on camera i hope that it's packaged itself into one of these bubbles and it's used this as a drive to move it to somewhere else it's not teleported Interesting. it's not teleported it's changed the space-time metric so that it has no mass or inertia and then you can move the next yeah. tour up as if it was one tour below with no effective mass and, and inertia you can move it around by the same way you move the one above but when it collapses, so, the, the, the problem I... Go on, go on, go on, no, go on. I was just going to ask, though, because I, I mean, what you just said there was a pretty big bingo moment for me, right? It's like you reduce that mass and you can move on. Can you move it in any direction if you do that? Or are you limited in the direction? Everything you see, the balls that come in can do, you can do. Everything that you can see any of these spheres do in any of the reports ever, you can do. They can move in any direction and there will be a no inertia inside that bubble. So they can be going along like that, and instantaneously they could go underground, they could go up into space, they could go forward, backwards, in immediately, as soon as that structure is formed. And the interesting thing is, time will slow down or stop for the p participants in there. And like, like I say, and Ken Shoulders in his writings has clearly demonstrated that you can go with a small field at one-tenth the speed of light. Well, it would take you no time at all. And and also, you could stop instantaneously. Now, I was describing sometime earlier today, we were at the technical museum here where I live, and I was saying, look, you know, there's a real problem yeah. if you get in a car accident, even at 75 miles an hour, because your 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 brain hits the dashboard, right? Uh, uh, sorry, your head hits the dashboard, your skull stops immediately, but your brain keeps moving forward, and it turns to mush, right? So, like, the, you can't decelerate, but you can in this. You can de decelerate instantaneously. So you can go from you can go from 600 miles an hour, capture it in this little bubble, move it at one tenth the speed of light to another point somewhere else, and stop it instantaneously and gently lay it down on the ground, and then you have a method for decohering the structure. And it might it might go zoom, zoom, and this go. <laughs> you, you, you hold it like one millimeter above the ground. Yeah, isn't the object in the bubble going to keep moving at the same speed that it got put into the bubble, or is that also able to be modified? Uh, well, I'm sure there's ways to get around that. I'm sure you, there's ways to get around that. Eff effectively, it, okay. it as soon as it's captured in that thing, it, it's it's relatively in that thing, if you know what I mean. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're kind of arguing that it should punch itself way out. No, it doesn't. It's stuck in there. It's locked. It's literally locked. So it's stuck in there. Now, I'm going so to... Think that the, if there's any, like... Yeah, one more thing real quick on that, because I think you talked about fermions and bosons and converting them. You know, are we talking about a situation where we convert them back? And if, if I'm talking about the videos, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, like, could the, thing, the occupants still be alive based on what that's happening? Can the plane survive the event that happens there, or is it going to be, you know, deconstructed, destroyed? You know, what are your theories on that based on? If you if you get this wrong, the most likely thing is that the matter is converted to other matter, right? Just that's what will happen, right? Um, that's what we see. It appears in physical experiments, so um, you don't want that. The fact that they were discussing exactly the toroidal moment as a means of intergalactic travel back in 1979 and they were right this is exactly what you need yeah. it's it's not approximate and i i wasn't i'm not a time traveler i didn't tell them to go and put them in this in this proposal right and when you look at the associated papers with this there's an associated paper from 1976 and they fire a laser in japan into a nonlinear plasma and they create toroids in the plasma with internal magnetic fields of over a thousand tesla that was repl replicated and funded by the u.s department of energy the uk the european union 
China, South Korea, and Japan, and published in 2021. They replicated the phenomena. They found that it produced, in their ones, if it was uh, 20-something microns across, it was uh, something like um, 1,360 Teslas. Okay, and bearing in mind the biggest M MIT superconducting magnet is 50 Teslas, right, for doing fusion. Okay, this is this is 1,300, and they note that the smaller it gets, the far higher the the magnetic strength gets. Okay, and I will show you this because I have it in my presentation here. Um, when I get there, am I am I showing my screen again? I can't can't tell now. <laughs> I've got so many things up. What am I showing? Okay, all right. I, oh, okay. So let, let me go uh, present a view. Here. Yeah, I'm going to need to wind down here. In a, okay. Uh, well, okay. So the, well, the, the, we, we come into the real money so shot you here. You want to try to conclude. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So here is this laser okay, paper. This is the laser paper, and it was published in Physics of Plasmas uh, in 2021. And... Uh, as this gets smaller, the magnetic field goes up. But note, here is your your uh, toroidal vortex motion on this back plane here. Here is the magnetic fields at 1.36 thousand Tesla. But also there's a magnetic field that comes to a hard stop here. Okay, now we already know that ions and electrons will come in here or matter will be pulled in here. Um, oh God, there's so much I need to go through. But anyway, um, all right, fine. Um, this is the phase singularity. You note that the magnetic yeah. field literally stops here. It stops. That is the magnetic si uh, singularity there. The phase singularity it stops. That is the magnetic core. Okay, and that is the same place at which the the uh, pointing vectors close. So you get electromagnetic, and everything. The gravitational wave comes through the center, and you're going to know this in a minute when you listen to John Wheeler. You know that the gravitational wave's coming through the center. You know the electro and magnetic fields are coming here, and it's a singularity. This is where you get the singularity in terms of um, unification of the forces at this point. Okay, so we're going to listen to John Wheeler. Hopefully, you can hear it because I'm going to move my mic down. Um, I don't know whether it'll pick it up. Let me know if you can hear it, um, and I will stop it at relevant points. It's going to let me do it. Is it going to let me do it? Uh, is it going to let me do it? Why isn't it let me do that? Oh, okay, that's that's going to not help. That's going to happen like that. <laughs> Come on. Okay, I, I might need to get that video separately. <laughs> Bear with me. If you have any questions now, fire them to me and I'll get that video up. Yeah. Uh, so I think that really, you know, just to kind of sum it all up, you know, I, I, I think that what the audience really wants to know is your thoughts on kind of the effects, you know, even so much as we, I think we appreciate the science a lot. And I hope that the academics who are watching will, you know, look at this and take it very seriously because a lot of people wonder and they think we talk about this kind of stuff that they think that it's not proven or that it's not supported by science. But I think as you've done here, you've shown that it absolutely is. And it's proven by science has been out there for decades. You know, so I think that what, from a perspective of the videos and the MH370 videos, what we kind of want to know is it's possible. What mm -hmm. are we looking at here? Mm -hmm. I think what I've heard, and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it, is that we could be looking at annihilation event. We certainly could be looking at, I'm going to still call it teleportation, but I think that really it's more complex than that. It's a situation where we can move an object, a, a matter wave can be moved around freely, just like we see these orbs move around, ignoring gravity. The inertia can be stopped entirely. We can have it, put it down wherever we want, theoretically. And to me, that's very powerful because mm -hmm. it answers a lot of the questions I've had about the videos. And, mm -hmm. and that's why, before I let you speak, I just want to say I appreciate you and the time is going through all this. So did I get that right? Or what are your thoughts just from the straight up, you know, kind of what could hypothetically be happening scenario? Yeah, so um, I, I very firmly believe that there's two most likely options. One total annihilation and i believe that this was developed as a weapon to remove uh projectiles i believe this is why th they don't care about kinzals 
Like you, you say, you say Putin gets up and he says, "Oh, if you move your carrier groups next to Israel, we'll we'll be able to uh, launch Kinzals from our Black Sea fleet from our aircraft." And it's like no one even bats an eyelid. Why? Because it doesn't matter if it's going at Mach thirteen or fourteen, because we can literally make them disappear. And it's the perfect technology. Why? It doesn't matter whether you've got a a dirty uh, um, uh, nuclear bomb. Or a fusion bomb, a thermonuclear bomb. A thermonuclear bomb still has plutonium in it, like a, like a, 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 a nuclear bomb. It has a plutonium trigger. If you knock these out of the sky with a missile or a tungsten thing falling down from a satellite, firstly, you only have as many uh, missiles as you have tungsten things coming from, from, from the satellite. You, it's not an electromagnetic system. Uh, which you can just re recharge by getting a bit more sunlight um, or nuclear charge on board. Um, you, you, you have a situation where you have raining down one of the most toxic substances to human life, which is uh, um, plutonium. And it's got a half-life of like 238,000 years or something ridiculous, okay? So this is going to be a problem for a very long time, every single bomb that rains down. But if you have a system that literally makes that matter convert whatever it is into light and leptons, which are all very friendly, right? It's not a problem. Nothing rains down. It's the literal perfect strategic defense initiative, right? The perfect one. Wow. So I honestly, my, my, my gut instinct, this is likely a technology that it was developed for destroying uh, um, intercontinental ballistic missiles and now Kinzars and that's why that's why America is way behind China and, and Russia on this because it doesn't matter and I have been saying this for years long before I saw your videos I've been saying they don't care about these weapons and and I believe that the, the Russians are onto this because their next generation of fighter jets will have no metal in them so they're less prone to being affected by this you know, they, they, they will have actually no weapons on them. No, nothing that will have metal in it if they can get away with it, right? So there's that. Yeah, Rupert, Rupert, can you switch your screen to the static and put short bases? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about this? Yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. I, want, I want to potentially touch this as well. I think that, so just from the aspect, right, is you just mentioned that you could have a perfect defense, some completely wipe out a bomb missile, anything that's coming. I, I've out, said for years, in short. Null. Yeah. I, I've said in short that I do not uh, I I have argued that the reason they don't care about Kinzals and upgrading their nuclear arsenal and stuff is because they already have a solution and I've said that they can knock these things out and I've quoted this number they can knock them out at one tenth of speed of light so who cares about Mac 14 you know um, they can get these things generate them move them to any location on earth at one tenth the speed of light easily I mean you can go faster but easily um, and, and and then literally, and I've literally said they can make the things disappear. That's lit, and it's recorded. I, I don't know which videos, and I've said it a number of times. So they don't care about it. And then when I saw your video, I go, oh, there you go, <laughs> there you go. It's that's it. <laughs> and it and it is the ball lightning structure. It is the monopoles. And when I will get this wheeler video, and we have to close with that, it is all you need to know. This is the guy that worked on the Manhattan Project. He was the tutor of Feynman. And he is the person who's attributed with talking about black holes and wormholes. And what he describes, when you know there is a gravity, because we've, we've, we've shared these videos, you can go and look at them, called e Extreme Interactions. Go and look at those videos. You can see when one of these EVOs is moving in this direction, not caring or at about any electro or magnetic fields in the reactor, another one comes over from here, and within an event horizon, it starts orbiting around it, or gets kicked away. But more interestingly, it does it in its forward directional path. So you have one coming over here and it starts orbiting around before it's even got it, <laughs> Get the, got there. So you know that there is a spin yeah. field coming out in, in front of this structure, right? Now, when those things are coming around the plane, they will not be pointing in any direction that will allow them to link their gravitational waves together. They will be arranging so that they have the center in that Visica Pisces out to the destruction beam there, and they will be pointing forward ideally, but they can move around as long as they don't link in a loop, like I showed you, right, in, in my 3D visualization. They mustn't link their gravitational layer. And I'll, I'll, I'll show with Wheeler, but essentially what happens is they're on the sub-tor level, but they're still individual 
end tours, right? When they rotate like that, this one links with that one, this one links with that one, and links with another one there. That gravitational wave creates a new gravitational azimuth through the center of the plane. That pinches these in, increasing the gravitational azimuth. That pinches it in. So it's a self-feeding loop. And they self-organize to the point at which their non-radiating boundaries repel each other. And then they form the tor above. And it's literally like that. You cannot even imagine how fast that will occur. And, and when they come together, they have to... Is that why they converge? They're self-converging, self-aligning, self-organizing. And, and it's all through gravitational waves. And I, you have to let me get Wheeler say his piece because everything you need to know is in what Wait. Wheeler says. So we're going we're to find out how to play this. If you've got any other Let's questions, I will see what... I also want to ask too. Yeah. Go on. Quick clarity. So I was thinking maybe can you to the like let's call it teleportate aspect again one more time and then show the video. Okay. And then after that, I'd like you to you know plug whatever you want to plug. Okay. <laughs> I, don't <laughs> I don't have much to plug. I don't have much to plug. Okay. So the the teleportation I would it, it, okay. So when you are in these structures, I believe that because the 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 epsilon zero has changed, uh, you're in your own space time bubble you will not really perceive time. And because you are in a fractal torus, and because your brain works on the toroidal moment, conscious brains need the toroidal moment for cognitive function, right? <clears throat> this is how people can do telekinesis and, and how Ninel Kalagina could stop a person's heart um, and, and move things around. She, she had the ability and the understanding to control these things. Uh, you can go and look up uh, Ninel Kalagina. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so um, if if you uh, are in there, your time will basically stop. Now, if you can move at one tenth of the speed of light, you have no inertia and you have no um, uh, uh, mass. You can accelerate fast and you can slow down fast. Okay. Now, what you do is you have no perception of time. In one blink of an eye, you're on another point in the planet and you're suddenly stopped. And that's it. To you, you have teleported. Right? Because in, in the blink of an eye, you're in a completely different location. So perceptually, yeah. you have teleported. Okay? And I've been joking to my to my, my, my wife's Vietnamese, and I and, and and I've been joking to her, like at some point, honey, I'm gonna be able to go to Vietnam and we're gonna be able to visit in our lunch break and come back through the planet. <laughs> Not around the planet, through the planet. The amount of energy is minimal, right? That we're got to pull this off is that because of the these electromagnetic effects that are happening where it's just amplifying itself we don't even need a large amount of energy to pull this off so imagine so imagine our, imagine one electron okay. imagine one electron that's how much energy you have to move that one electron right now you have to move that electron from here to here Nothing. it's almost zero oh, and it's well described in in wow. ken shoulders papers almost effortlessly now the point is why would you not want this technology to get out well you imagine everyone has a craft that uses nearly no energy and they could go to any point on earth and they don't have to go through baggage control they don't have to show their passports they don't have to do x y and z how the hell could you completely control humanity how could you well you would have to convince them oh, yeah. to have a chip in their body which would switch up them off and by the way the same technology yeah. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to go into the, what else you can do with the technology. It's bad enough with this. <laughs> God. I was going to say, too, it's like I was thinking, oh, oh, we can make, you know, infinite energy. But, but now it's almost the opposite. We just don't need any energy. You don't need now, it. Having any amount of energy now boosts tens of burdens. I, I've said, look, you've got hydroelectric. I'll tell you how you can make an energy generator from this. You've got a hydroelectric dam. Excellent. We're already 99.9% .9 of the way there. We use one of these structures. We capture 4 million tons of water and we put it in your reservoir at the top. We let it run through your generator. Done. <laughs> and there's many ways you can think about this. Like, you want a heat pump? We use uh, uh, zero bath. 
single bath thermal extraction you make an extremely cold area over here and you make an extremely hot area over here by using the reverse and you have a hot and a cold zone well you can use a thermoelectric generator you can you can you can uh, change the epsilon uh, zero for one side of a load of rocks on a pulley system running around two cogs t tied to a dynamo and literally this side's lighter and all the time it's within the beam of that and it goes around in a loop and it, oh, when it goes over the top it's heavier right you just you know you there's so many ways you can make an electrical generator but the reality is you can convert matter to energy now if you take two deutrons and you fuse them, that's 25, roughly, million electron volts, right? You, if you take carbon and oxygen and oxygen, you get CO2, that's 5 electron volts. So you can see why 25 is bigger than 5, right? Even if you take 5 and you divide it by 4 nucleons, that's a lot lot bigger than 5, right? It's, it's, it's 25 million, right? But if you take a nucleon in the to a baryon, like a proton or a neutron, and you turn that into pure energy by unraveling all of that electromagnetic energy that's trapped in that non-radiating structure, that anapole that is the, the baryon, right? If you rip that apart, it's over 900 million electron volts. There is nothing beyond this. There is nothing beyond this. It's 133 times more energy than you get from fusion. Do you understand the magnitude of this? So and yes, basically infinite energy at that. Yeah. As Salvatore Pia says, you. Need? I'm paraphrasing, but in his patent, like let, let's we can destroy asteroids, but we can also generate. We we can take four units about the size of a domestic fridge. We can put them around the the central plane of the Earth, and using the power to run a domestic kettle for a week, we can create a singularity at the center of the earth and the entire earth will disappear that's basically what it says in the salvatore Pyatt patents and on the next line it says using this at the same conclusion i came to using this application of this principle we can also uh, do fusion energy now you can do matter to mm -hmm, energy exactly. direct conversion now th this is where you have to understand that this is the great power Anyone that has a face has the answer. This is the this is the structure, right? So we are built in the the technology that runs the entire universe, and can build it, and completely unbuild it, right? Depending on whether it's going one way or the other. And th this, the the weird thing is, is I, I I used to mock Star Trek for always having these aliens with just a load of prosthetic on their face. The, we are the answer to the program. It's in our face. So let me get... I've got to get this Wheeler thing because it's the most succinct way. Yeah, pull up Wheeler. And then, yeah. Let, let, uh, that was amazing. Out there. Thank you, Bob, for that admission. I appreciate that. Uh, the, the, this is the new dawn of an old age. And I'm, why is that not playing? Is it going to play there? Go on, play for me. Maybe maybe I've just got no resources. I'm going to close that down and restart it again. Okay. Um, I'll close down. No problem. Uh, this as well. No, I won't close Zoom. That would be a problem. <laughs> While you're pulling that up, I thank you for um, being on Hard Truths for two here today and going through all this evidence. I think that this is the perfect example of hard truths. This is information that a lot of people have a hard time understanding and accepting. Just went through the implications just a second ago. I and mean, we are talking about new sources for being able to need very little power to move things and essentially support them throughout the planet or technology that could actually create doomsday weapons and dirt this whole planet. No, 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 no. You can destroy suns. You can destroy suns. Yeah, we can destroy maybe even, we can maybe, I mean, I don't even want to necessarily go into all the there because it starts to freak me out a little, but it's very uh, scary. <laughs> very big. It means that we have to be very responsible, I think, with this technology. I'm not, I'm not going to be religious here, but I'm going to say, Jesus said, the meek shall inherit the earth. But the word meek is a mistranslation from prowess, from, from the original Greek. And it, it actually means those that know that they have great power, but choose not to use it, will inherit the earth. There's one significant problem with this technology. If it's used in a war, I believe it will destabilize the magnetic field that locks the crust to the earth's mantle. And we will have a cataclysmic event. It cannot be used in war. You cannot use this in anger. I'm not talking about destroying the planet. I'm talking yeah, about wiping everything off the face of the earth. Literally wiping it. 
like with a cloth. Oh, I yeah. It makes me even not try to review the this technology. To understand, this is most likely the why it's being held back. The reason of disinformation is that the same people, the same conclusion that you and I have come. But the reality is, I think they've had this forever. Humanity deserves it. As you pointed out, it can change the world. It can change the circumstances of millions, if not billions, as I've brought up, of people that have nothing on this planet. But we have to use it responsibly, right? Absolutely, Ashton. You are bang on. Absolutely bang on. And the, the thing is, we used this on Earth before. It's in all of the ancient symbology. Every aspect of this is precisely in the ancient symbology. And it, you, any species at any point in the universe can easily cre uh, uh, learn how to do this from just observing nature. Like I said, I did no maths and no preconceptions. I literally looked at what was under a microscope, what's going on, and I started drawing pictures until, oh my God, this is how it works. And it's so simple. Right, I'm going to see if Wheeler will work now. Yes, okay, he's going to work. So let's see. Right, I'm going to move you down here. You got it? Yeah, I think what so. Up? What up? <laughs> and uh, he speaks really slowly, but that's good because I'm going to st stop him and then and I'm just going to fill in the uh, that slideshow. And this is the guy that invented black holes, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> presenter view. Can we look? Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, is it going to do it for me or what? Radiation, a pencil of radiation. I'm all, I need to share my screen, don't I? I hear it, yeah. Yeah, I need to share my... Because they're seeing it, but you're not seeing it. So on your, I want it on your recording. That's, that's the, fine. Is it there's... No, no, I, 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 want, I want it on your recording. In here as well. Uh, where are we going? Where have you gone now? Oh, no. <laughs> I've got about a million windows open here. <laughs> right, share screen. Uh, I want desktop to share. Okay, right. Okay, all right. All right. Okay, so you can see it here, and I'm gonna do, go uh, on to Wheeler here. Wheeler dealer, take it away. Uh, right, go on, do it for me. Radiation, a pencil of radiation, carries energy with it, and energy has mass, and therefore, a pencil of radiation must exert some attraction on things beside it. Okay. Pencil of radiation, like so, let's say a light beam. It's got energy. E equals mc squared. It therefore must have ant mass. Therefore, it exerts some attraction around it. What about getting a pencil of radiation curved into a circle so the light goes round and round? Then the attraction it exerts is concentrated as if at the center. So what is it that bends this circle, this pencil of radiation into the circle? It's the gravitational attraction of the pencil of radiation itself. So this structure here, which looks very much like the structures I derived, this is from his 1954's Guillaume's paper. This has a gravitational azimuth going through the center. And that is a stable structure called Gion, and he predicted that things in the universe were made like this. Okay? So, everywhere around this pencil of radiation that's going around, you have an attraction. But the, this stable structure is held together by the gravitational azimuth. That means there is a gravitational vector going through the center. As I said before, there will be a gravitational beam going through the center of this. Right, let him carry on. That was the idea of the genome. Actually, if you think of different possibilities for the size of that genome, bigger or smaller, you find that if it's very big, the energy is low. To push the radiation together requires energy. And you climb a hill like the of a volcano until you've come to a maximum energy. So to do this ordinarily, you have to put energy in to push it together. And, and it takes more and more energy to push it together. Okay, wait. And then if the pencil of radiation becomes any smaller in size, the energy starts to go down. 
and the thing collapses. So Geon is really an unstable entity. It either blows up into a cloud of radiation traveling away in all directions, or it collapses into a totally collapsed object, something that we today would call a black hole. Okay, so if you can push it together enough, the thing would collapse into a black hole. But wait, there's more. But <laughs> that stability analysis, I didn't have in mind when I first published this work. Only later did I see that that's the feature that's dominant. But nowadays, I'm attracted with the idea that this pencil of radiation going around in a circle does not have to be light. It could be gravitational waves. Right. So we already know we've got a gravitational beam coming through here, through our structure, mm -hmm. right? Wait. And you can have gravitational waves imploding to make a black hole. There you go. Everything you need to know is in that little clip by the guy that came up with the term black hole. It's yeah. it's that's amazing for me. It's a bit of a spiritual moment to yeah, de sure. be able to decode that. And and this is a guy at yeah, the end of his life know, when people get like, honest. Well, Sorry, go on, go on. I was just gonna say I think that for me I was gonna say just very brief that you know uncovering the science behind this has actually led to me a better spirit understanding for me as well. It just this is all so deep, and I think from the perspective, it's just completely unknown. So. The last few months of going through learning from you and other engineers and physicists um, it gave me a whole new understanding of our reality to be. So thanks for sharing that John Wheeler video. It's awesome. Yeah, so it's freely downloadable from remoteview.icu. It is my uh, practical applications for the fractal toroidal moment. Uh, what I mean is each substructure, which can go down to torrids that, that are twice the diameter of the Planck's distance, um, and each level can have two or up to 48, but maybe a little bit more um, subtors. You can imagine there is uh, almost unfathomable numbers of ways this can be organized. Um, but the things self-assemble so, so darn quick. And what he's saying there is what I started out with is these tors, when they arrange themselves so the gravitational waves are pulled into the next one and pulled in, they pinch in, they make the new gravitational azimuth and pinch in until it forms a stable structure. And at that point, it's not in our space-time. Uh, it either collapses, which he says, it can go into a black hole, and I've described how when those things occur, you're not necessarily expecting thermal energy out. You're going to get other forms of field energy out. Um, uh, or you could have a stable structure that is self-similar, like the ones that were brought in in the first place, and can be manipulated in all of those magical ways you saw them being manipulated when they were brought into the side of the plane. I would like to think it's the latter. That's what I would like to think. Awesome. Well, thanks, Bob. Bob, I appreciate you having uh, being on here for Harsh Roos, number two. You were a great guy here today. You went through some awesome something. You blew a lot of people's minds. So I would just close it out by asking you, Pat, and plug, you know, whatever you want to hear at this point, shout out anyone in your shout out. You know, this is your opportunity, Pat. Thanks a lot, Bob. Okay, well, I want to thank uh, um, all of the people that have supported the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project at quantumheat.org uh, over the years. You can find us on the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project on uh, uh, X, or on um, uh, Facebook, on uh, um YouTube, uh, and you can also see my own personal writings on uh, um, uh, remoteview.icu, and that is uh, 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 the, the tagline on that is "Back to the Future through Insight and Critical Fiction." And uh, I would also particularly like to thank um, the the late uh, um, Neil Crichton Gold, who came up with who who's confident enough in an experiment that I 
I, I suggested uh, and produced some incredible experiments. And also Henk Urin in recent years, uh, my wonderful colleague Alan Goldwater in California, uh, without which his SEM I would not have been able to understand um, many researchers that have shared their information with us over the year, and David Bootlier, who produced some of the most fan fant fantastic coherent matter traveling ways and allowed us to decode this thing that I was talking about, how they, they project something in front of them that is able to affect, affect like objects. I'd also like to thank the, the sadly departed earlier this year, uh, uh, Takaki Matsumoto, uh, we have a reprint of this book, Steps to the uh, Discovery of Electronuclear Collapse. I recommend everyone get a copy. We make two cents on this <laughs> in royalties, uh, two dollar cents. <laughs> um, so if you want to donate to the project, pretty much every video it has um, op uh, ways in which you can donate to the project underneath it. Um, uh, everyone that's worked with the project has done it on a... Um, essentially on their own resources basis they, they've often given up jobs or they've had had, had no uh, other income at, at other times and stuff but uh, for, for me this this is the great uh, I call it since the early 2017 the God's toolbox um, I, I say that with a little g because there are people out there that have stolen the big G's God's glory and uh, um, they are taking it from themselves and they are using it. Uh, and the, the other ways that this can be used is just it, it, the, everything you can possibly think of that you can do. I can't watch a superhero movie because everything is possible. Freeze rays, in, in, instantaneous annihilation, cloning, teleportation. Uh, um, you know, every single thing is possible. And 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 it's you, you have to completely change your... your um, your framework of reality when you get this and and also that it is based on the sacred geometry every single classical building uh from the ancient world through to the greek architecture and the roman architecture and every derivative from that and and the, the obviously the christian church is just a manifestation of this the great pyramid of egypt all of these things they are based on this technology uh, uh and if you want to understand a small fragment of that go to the martin fleischmann memorial projects youtube channel and follow every presentation that starts with the uh, phrase o dash day you can search o dash day it's spanning six years. You can follow my personal journey, unredacted, even the stuff that I get wrong, the experiments, you, the live uh, SEM sessions, everything that explored this thing. And I want to thank the community that have been with me in, whilst I was in stealth mode, uh, essentially, uh, these past six years, uh, trying to get the stuff out of the door so it cannot be unsaid. Um, if anyone else has a terabyte out there and can download 4, 4K downloader, I'd be very happy for you to clone the channel. And if you want to use any single piece of material that is published by the MFMP in video form, in image form, or in uh, um, on on the any 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 way, um, uh, please do so. Obviously, crediting the project and 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 backlinking. Um, but uh, uh, we are at the dawn of a old new dawn of an old age, and. Uh, it's great to be back. Uh, this is our uh, species inheritance. We are built in the image of the technology that drives this. But we shouldn't let those that want to lord it over us and hold dominion over us to use this technology to control both our physical reality, our perceptions of what is possible, what is right and just, and what uh, um, literally control our minds, which is something you can do with it as well. So on 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 that level, I would say... You do not need to fear nuclear weapons. You do not need to fear them at all. It's a fraud because they can make them disappear from the sky. They can make them disappear from the sky. Your money is being taken out of your pockets for things that are not real things. And there needs to be some coming together of nations uh, to recognize that this is a real possibility. The immense threat it could it, this could present on a, on a completely disappearing of our planet state <laughs> level but also the fact that we are being lied to we have an ability to convert matter directly into energy we to travel without all of those tedious uh, time delays and and nonsense 
And this planet with this technology could support 10, 20, 100 times its current population without flooding another rainforest, chopping up a load th of tens of thousands of eagles, uh, uh, all kinds of technologies which are really, really rather redundant when you understand what is possible with this. I want to thank Ashton for his incredible hard work on um, getting this information out. Um, and uh, 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 please share this, Ashton's work, very, very widely um, and learn. If you have any questions, come to remoteview.icu, ask them. I tried to do a regular uh, blog post, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, a video session on, on a Sunday night if I can. Uh, this is in lieu of that, um, but hopefully uh, you can come along and uh, uh, ask questions. Obviously, um, you know, it's helpful if you've done the homework. I, 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 some people have watched every video we've ever put out over the last 11 years, and that takes four months. Um, uh, there, there's people that just do the O-Day, and I think you can probably do that with the reference logic. And everything that I have published, it's links back to mainstream scientific journals, and we have shown experiments that you can conduct, even as a three-year-old in seven minutes that shows this basic principle with a $35 budget, okay? It's literally Galileo asking the people calling him a her heretic to look through the telescope and see the planets as they are actually moving. We are at that point of absurdity in this revelation. So thank you very much, Ashton. Thank you for giving me the forum to blather on there. Yeah, and so I just want to say on behalf of MH370X organization, we're up to solve the videos, looking to advance technology, uh, we want to give you an honorary membership in our organization. <laughs> we want to let you know. Welcome to MH70X, sir. I'm honored. So I'm honored. For today's podcast on uh, hard not on hard